Placer County Planning Commission. And our first item is the flag salute. Please join me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Next item is uh, roll call. Sue? Good morning, um, Mr. R. Curry. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Mr. Moss. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Nader. Here. And Mr. Rokuchi. Here. Thank you. Next item, a report from the planning director. And you lucked out today by having this meeting here. I just want to make that statement. <laughs> it was my, it was my else, else you would have, you, it, it was six years ago. We're, I still haven't forgotten that meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of us remember. With, some, with the snow, in, we remember. In six remember. years, I've gotten really good at weather forecasting. So I can <laughs> out-predict anybody. Uh, EJ, what do, you, what, do you have, news. EJ anyway, what do you I'm have for we, us today? I'm glad we are down here. So. Uh, and, and, you know, with that, uh, we're trying something new today, uh, which I'm excited about. Uh, we have a live video feed uh, connect, connecting us to the county administrative office up in Tahoe City. Uh, so that allows, hello, uh, it works. So uh, they hear us. Uh, so, you know, I want to welcome Tahoe folks uh, for coming in. Uh, and I really want to thank our administrative services team who uh, put all this together. Uh, Dieter Wittenberg, Greg Courier, uh, Jeremy Kelly, and the rest of their team. Uh, those are the guys who are always behind the scenes that we don't typically see, but they make everything truly function and work. Also, uh, many of you know Rick Erie. He, he is our engineering and surveying division manager. Uh, he recently went up to Tahoe to manage the Cedra office up there in Tahoe City. Rick is there. Rick is, he's probably hidden there, but he's somewhere up there. Uh, we'll see him in the room shortly. Uh, other news, uh, our Board of Supervisors over the last couple uh, months reappointed three commissioners uh, to another term. So Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner Moss, and Commissioner Nader, I want to congratulate you for uh, being signed up for a, another whirlwind tour. Uh, and we'll be swearing, uh, swearing you in, uh, in in just a minute here. I'd like to also update you on some recent Planning Commission actions. Uh, that you've taken uh, and uh, some subsequent actions. Last week on January 25th, as uh, Larry knows, the uh, TRPA Governing Board unanimously approved the Tahoe Basin Area Plan and the Tahoe City Lodge. Uh, so the long five-year effort uh, uh, proved to be very successful. I don't know if Larry wants to add anything more on that. I won't put you on the spot, but I already did. <laughs> uh, it had a little bumpy start in the beginning, but I think that county staff along with support from TRPA did a good job real good well, thank you thank you uh, other projects the Dedurka minor land division appeal that was denied by the Commission that was uh, again appealed to the Board of Supervisors so that will be considered uh, next week at its February 7th meeting Porcupine Hill extension of time also approved by the uh, Commission that was appealed to the board as well and that's tentatively scheduled for a March board meeting, uh, March 7th. Uh, we're hoping to get that on. And then Barton Ranch subdivision, which you recommended approval to the board, that will also be going on March uh, 7th. That's our target date. As far as upcoming planning commission hearings, uh, as you know, next week, February 9th, we've canceled that hearing just because we're doing a special meeting today. Uh, we do have a pretty good schedule for February 23rd. Uh, we have a we're going to hold that meeting down here in Auburn. Uh, there are Tahoe projects on that, uh, the Plump Jack project. Uh, that's a redevelopment of the Plump Jack Squaw Valley Inn. Also Palisades at Squaw, which is that's a 63 unit, uh, a mix of single family residences and uh, half plexes on about 19 acres. Uh, we have an extension of time appeal for Camel's Hump. Uh, that was uh, from the Parcel Review Committee's uh, decision that we'll be hearing. And then we have several other extensions of time uh, that we'll be handling on the 23rd. Uh, March 9th, we don't have that dialed in, what's going to happen on March 9th as far as location or what's on that agenda, but uh, just as long as you have that on your calendar. So that is what I have for you today. Any questions? The 23rd, it will it'll be at our normal uh, meeting place? You know, February 23rd, we may we may use the same venue if it's available. Oh, okay. So and uh, know, and okay. also do a live feed up uh, in Tahoe. Okay. Any questions of EJ? All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, EJ. 
Next item on, on our agenda is, as, as EJ mentioned, we have the three commissioners. I don't review their names because he went over them, but they're going to have the swearing in now in oath of office. And Sue, I think you're going to handle them all. So if they, I guess they would all stand up in place with the raise their right hand. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Jeffrey Moss, Wayne Nader, and Richard Johnson. So raise your right hand, please. And repeat after me. I. I, I state your name. Richard Johnson. Wayne Nader. Do solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear truth, faith. That I will bear truth, faith. And allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, and that I will will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This one we clap. <laughs> already did that once. <laughs> okay, the next um, item is a uh, planning commission selection of the officers, and I'd like to have uh, Wayne uh, say a few words here, start to start us off with. Yeah, thank you, Richard. I uh, first want to say I appreciate you in your last year of serving as the chairman of our committee. Um, this has been an incredible year. I didn't know I was signing up for so this. Battle, battle uh, ground. Yeah. Uh, you probably had, uh, I'm not sure if it's on record, but we had a 10-hour hearing up in Tahoe, which had to be one of the longest, if not the longest, meetings of this commission. So um, it was a very busy year, a very contentious year, and I want to thank you for leading us through it. Well, I made it. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have something I first want to share with commission and those of you that are here. I was recently um, uh, diagnosed with a health issue, and it's going to require me to leave the area for probably at least two months, probably starting in March. And because of that, I believe that it's not I'm not well serving this commission or the community by taking the chair position or at least allowing you folks to vote me into the chair position. So I have had conversations with EJ and with Karen and also with Richard uh, Johnson, and I'd ask uh, if he would be receptive to taking the chair position for 2017 and allowing me, at least again, the commission's decision to stay on as the vice chair. And he graciously agreed to do that. So I would like to make a motion to have Richard Johnson be a chair for 2017. Second. Second. We moved and seconded. Any other nomination? If not, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried unanimously. We don't need to do roll call on that one. And now selection of the vice chair. Mr. Chairman, Go ahead. we make a motion that uh, Wayne Nader be vice chair. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Second. Wayne Nader be uh, selected as uh, vice chair, continuing that position. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously in a selection of the secretary for 2017. I'd like to make a motion of uh, Jeff uh, Moss being the secretary for 2017. Second. We moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, now we're going we're gonna to have the new chair take over. Oh, boy. He's, he's <laughs> <the> chairs. <laughs> Give us a, just one minute to get all of our, our our bundle of stuff here, and we'll continue with the meeting <coughs> shortly. Okay, let me get my stuff out of here. Okay. Yeah, good idea. And congratulations to all you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Thank you very much. You guys should probably change name plates too. <laughs> 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 
a good idea. You have two pins? No, I took mine with me and I you left yours here. <laughs> okay. Jesus, we're getting off the rocky start, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, please forgive us for a minute while we uh, get, organized. get organized. And so I guess we're down to the point now where we're going to be taking a look at the uh, extension. Is it in? Yeah. Uh, I think we're at uh, public public next, next item is public comment. Oh, you have to forgive me. Here, I'm just. Rocky Star. Forgiven. <laughs> we'll work our way through this. Yeah, you're breaking me in here. Okay, uh, yeah, now's the time where we do uh, public comment. And so uh, anybody in either place that would like to make a comment about anything that's not on the agenda today, you're sure welcome to do it right now. Not seeing any hands or motion. We'll uh, move on. And... Uh, we have a consent agenda, and that covers, I believe, our last agenda package and uh, approval of the minutes. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Okay, I guess we do a roll call on that. That was Wayne Nader. Yes. And Jeffrey Moss. Okay. Um, now, Last time we talked about doing the chairperson last, and since you've changed the CD on my on me, I'm going to be jumping around here. <laughs> okay, well, we're being very flexible today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's go with Mr. R. Curry. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yeah. Mr. Rokucci. Yes. And Mr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now we're down to the extension of time. And uh, somewhere in my package, I have it here. You might uh, go ahead. This is Alan. Yep. Uh, Alan Bruce. I'm planning staff from Tahoe, so I'm a pleasure to be down here. We've had quite a bit of snow, and you're more than welcome to come up and see us anytime you wish. <laughs> um, we got the storms are starting again. So um, the first project, I'm going to have two projects before you. One of them is an extension of time. I do have Gary Davis here, the applicant. Is in the back here if there's any questions he'd be more than happy to answer them um, but this particular project is within the Tahoe Basin it's called 6731 Tahoe uh, it was initially approved by the Planning Commission in 2012 in February and because of the assembly bills as well as our board resolutions from our board allowed five years to continue without it expiring uh, unfortunately what's happened now is that it will expire February 9th this year which is right around the corner so the applicant is requesting a two-year extension to allow them to continue with those entitlements. The entitlements um, is a tentative parcel map and a conditional use permit. So the location is in Tahoe Vista. Uh, currently it is in the community plan of Tahoe Vista. It's right across the street from Tonopolo. Uh, it's on the mountain side of the highway. The zoning is tourist commercial. Um, which allows timeshare projects with this particular project is um, you can see there's 21 hotel motel units that exist there today as part of the project those will be removed and demolished um, then there is the duplex structures so you see 10 of them and there will be two timeshare units each a total of 20 units as part of the project because Tonopolo across the street many years ago they used to own this property. Uh, they do not now. It's under different ownership. But there is entitlements that have 14 parking spaces right at this location for overflow that the Planning Commission approved based on some concerns the neighborhood had. So that stays with the land that, and the applicant is proposing to make its own parking area for Tone Apollo. There is workforce housing. There's Anderson Road right here that comes off Highway 28. And they're proposing um, to actually build and construct the workforce housing component, not only for Tonopala, but for their project as well. Yeah, this is a closer view of the workforce housing component. They have their own access off of Anderson at this location. How many units are there in the workforce housing? Uh, total of, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, with 
Tone Apollo, there was two, and then you're proposing the one, I think, is it? And then you have, you have a caretaker unit too. Right. So, um, so yeah, so they're proposing as part of the project, and it is conditioned uh, with it. Um, so staff is recommending a two-year extension on this. You will see in the packet uh, the traffic fees did go up since five years. So that is a revision on that. If there's any questions on that, I'd be more than happy to, to answer those questions. I do have the applicant here, as I mentioned, to answer any questions. Alan, I know this really isn't a part of what we're trying to decide on as far as the extension today, but I think one of the issues that's been brought up is about the derelict property that's there. And I'm just wondering if, uh, in the interest of the community, if the owner would consider removing it now or why they haven't removed it. I'll let, yeah, if you guys want to answer that question. Is there any other questions for staff? Okay. Okay, so I guess the, the applicant has just stepped forward. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Nick Exline. I work with uh, Midkiff and Associates out of the Tahoe Basin. I have been working with Gary Davis on this project since the beginning. Um, Pleasure to be in front of you all today. So quickly, um, as it relates to the, the trash and debris on site, it has actually been uh, routinely gone through and kind of cleaned out. But fundamentally, what we've seen is kind of the, the problem we're having is because of, if you've seen the current condition of the site, it's a rundown 1940s motel. So we come through and clean it up, and then people continue to dump trash there because they see a vacant lot. So fundamentally, what we've been working on doing is we just had the, the we've continually had the um, groundskeeper come through and sweep through and, and pick up debris and pick up trash and, and move that in to keep it into uh, as pristine a condition as possible with the understanding that our intent is to demolish, um, ideally, if we're granted this extension, the 2017 construction season. A reason why you haven't knocked it down already if it's obviously intent is to eventually do that is yeah it and a it, cost factor no it, it was actually kind of a fundamental we were we were working through uh, through a very diligent process with a with a potential financier um, out of Manhattan and then it was one of those unfortunate situations and that's kind of what precipitated the extension is that at the 11th hour as a result of kind of their internal workings they they changed their you know their procedural processes which impacted us which kind of left us out in the cold, if you will. And so fundamentally the idea was, or the, the desire was, to get that financing in place before demolition. However, now as a result of the, the proposed extension, our intent is to demolish um, as soon as we're able to in the 2000, 2017 construction season, which hopefully will be May 1st with the grading, but there is a lot of snow on the ground, so it may push a little bit further back. But the intent is to do it on, uh, on May 1st. Uh, hopefully that would uh, deal with the issues that's been going on up there. At least we have a, uh, for the community has a date certain on that, I would say, right? Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, any more comments or questions? Anybody at Tahoe? Does anybody at Tahoe have any comments? Anything from Tahoe? And I guess we're into the public comment period right now. Go ahead, sir. We can see you. We can't hear you, though. Okay. Okay. My name is Dale Chamblin, and I'm president of the Vista Pines Homeowners Association, representing eight homes on the west side of this proposed project. In 2011, Paul and Brad Clapper proposed a development plan that had a perimeter road design that was not favored by the neighbors on both sides of this parcel. The Clappers sincerely, sincerely and generously worked with adjacent communities to find a compromise that was largely acceptable. However, as we all know, it's six years later, and a shovel has not touched the ground. Moreover, the dilapidated property that was unfit for residency 20 years ago continues to deteriorate. I have some pictures. Uh, I don't know if you can see them from there, but there is one of the dilapidated buildings over the fence. There's also one you can see from the street with a fence knocked down. Um, 
all the uh, buildings had collapsed fences and railings, uh, broken windows in almost every unit, abandoned equipment throughout. The problem with the community is not only the eyesore, but the fact that the derelict and decaying homes have uh, structures or havens for critters. Uh, bears have broken into five of our eight homes, and we have good reason to believe they come over the fence from 6731. In fact, we've seen them do so. Last summer, I had a conversation with two North Tahoe firemen who were inspecting the property and who advised me they were citing the owners for the buildup of trash and rubble. A half-hearted cleanup was undertaken, but it fell far short of any significant improvement. When notification of this meeting was received by our homeowners, one of them, Ron Casper, wrote an email to the seven others that says in part, quote, we see no reason to oppose their request for a plan extension, provided there are no changes to the approved design. But now is the time to force the issue of cleanup. I suggest that we ask Dale to attend this meeting on behalf of the homeowners, advising that we are not opposed as long as they tear down all the buildings and take out the debris so that the lot looks similar to what spindle shanks used to be, and Larry Sevenson can tell you about spindle shanks. All the other homeowners agreed. We respectfully request that you make the approval of this extension conditional on scraping the lot and establish a reasonable timetable for doing so. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, is there any more public comment? Okay. Good morning, um, Ellie Waller, Tahoe Vista resident. Um, I live less than a mile from here, and I do agree with uh, Dale that there are some issues with the site. The Bear League has been out. Uh, there's been problems. They boarded up the buildings. Um, just like the Hendrickson site, which we've now approved as the Tahoe City Lodge, uh, this blighted area needs to be cleaned up sooner than later. Um, the TRPA permit states this permit will expire August 1, 2017, without further notice unless the construction has commenced prior to the date and is diligently pursued thereafter. Commencement of construction consists of pouring concrete for a foundation and does not include grading installation of utilities or landscaping. Diligent pursuit is defined as completion of the project within the approved construction schedule. The expiration date shall not be extended unless the project is determined by TRPA to be the subject of legal action. The disconnect between the permit with Placer and TRPA also needs to be explored at some point during this process. Um, um, I would like to make sure that the demolition, as stated by um, the applicant, does take place and is conditioned formally in writing that it will happen in 2017. There was a crew on site a couple years ago when Spindleshanks, which was another project with a similar issue and extensions that uh, has not been built and is now in uh, trustee bankruptcy. We don't want to see that happen here, especially until the demolition is done so I would appreciate and hope that you could get something in writing that states that the applicant will for sure demolish this year thank you thank you okay well, are there any more comments from the public mr. Davis thank you Gary Davis civil engineer for the project uh, this fall, the cleanup was done on the property. Trees were removed that were fallen down and broken. Uh, bed springs, mattresses, and other <clears throat> debris was hauled to the public dump this fall. That's been cleaned up as much as we can. We have four to five feet of snow on the ground right now, so not quite practical to get in there and do anything at the moment. We don't even know if there's anything there at the moment. Also, um, the, the bear issue has been solved. This fall, late fall, they went in and put uh, steel uh, straps and so forth over openings where bears had been getting under buildings and in buildings, and we believe that there are no bears on the property right now. And uh, we do intend to do the demolition, but I would uh, object to having that as a condition since it's not going to be able to be done until after the deadline's passed. Thank you. After what passes? The deadline for this extension, oh, okay. which is this month, February. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I guess not seeing a lot more public comment. I guess the applicant, do you have anything more to say? 
No, um, except that I think I think Gary Davis covered the uh, again. My name is Nick Eckstein for the applicant. Uh, Gary Davis covered the 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 issues at play. Um, our intent is to to, to demolish in 2017, but I, I share his concerns as as it relates to the condition. Um, and I'm available for more questions. Thank you. Okay. Would you be opposed to us setting the 2017 year as a deadline for doing that, so that? And then fundamentally, our, our exercise within the um, – there is a, a slight clarification I'd make into due diligence. TRPA, um, kind of following the 2008 um, financial crash, uh, took into account um, financial reasons as, as it related to the need for permit extensions. And so when we first reached out to Placer County, our goal was to see if we could kind of meld those two dates together for the obvious reasons. Um, we were not able to achieve that objective, but the goal being the demolition in 2017, which moves forward due diligence with TRPA, and then a subsequent permit extension with uh, TRPA as well. And I've been in contact with TRPA as it relates to this uh, potential extension and very similar conversation we're having today. Well, I just hate to see it slip beyond this summer, because uh, it is a mess. And, it's, and, and I know it's, personally it's not your fault. It's conditions and and financing and all that, but I, it something ha should be done. I, uh, well, I'll leave it up to some of my colleagues here. See if they have any. Isn't that, a, isn't that a code enforcement kind of issue? Well, it's not yeah. being a habit. There's no. Well, let's uh, let's see. I guess that's it for uh, the applicant. Can, and so at this time, I'll bring it back to the commission for uh, deliberation. Can I ask County Council to kind of guide us in this? I mean, or uh, we're looking at an extension, just purely as an extension. Now, can we condition it? I mean. Jeff obviously brought up a good point that it's a code enforcement issue potentially. Yeah, I mean, you, you do, there is an option. I mean, right now the request is to, is for a two year extension of time. The commission could decide to grant just a one year extension of time uh, to this permit and, you know, to shorten that time frame to see if something, you know, if the work that is anticipated to be done is actually done. What if we could, they gave them two one year extensions? In other words, one year. And then the second year, automatic if the work is done uh, to remove the old buildings and so forth. Is that out of the question? I, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I'd say if you, if you want to set some, some sort of deadline to move this forward, um, consider changing it to a one-year extension of time. Then it would come back for a public hearing um, to see if due diligence hasn't been done, if, if it's necessary to have a second extension of time. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, any other comments or discussion points from the commission? I'm not. I'm not sure that adding two one year actually solves our problem. I mean, it it, it brings them back here, but it we so we'll still have a whole year with the problem there. I mean, well, the thought was that you would give them a one year extension now, with the understanding that at the end of that period they would. Have to come back. Do the necessary cleanup and remove the old buildings. Then they would automatically get another year to start the next process. But it, it, staff's recommending against that for some reason. So uh, maybe the next best thing is to just have a one-year extension right now, and then with the understanding that we'll entertain a, another year's extension if the if it's cleaned up. Is that? Um, well, they'd have to come back for that extension. Yes, they'd have to come back for an extension. Do you want to make that as a motion? Well, we'll see. Uh, if, if there's no more discussion, then uh, I'm open for a motion here. All right. Well, I'll make that a motion that that we give them, the, we grant them the one-year extension, and encourage them to get the work done and bring it back for another year extension at that time, uh, at the end of the what, first year. With all of the with all the conditions that uh, have m maybe have been changed because of. Um, the extra fees or the new fee schedules, whatever was, was in the new conditions or upgraded fee schedule. As of today. Yeah. As part of that motion, you may consider uh, condition number 94 and the change in the expiration date to February 21st, 2018 instead of 2019. Yeah. And 12 yeah. months. Uh, changing the... I'm not catching Okay. That. 
Okay. So you're really talking about a one-year oh. extension to 2018, 18. February 2018? I guess we better hear from the applicant. Maybe he's got some comment on that, you know, and maybe there's a real reason why he can't do that. I, 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 I think it would be fair to give him enough. So you haven't made a motion yet. You're just thinking. Well, I start, I was making a motion, <laughs> but I, he, the applicant seems desperate to get a comment in. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll give the applicant a chance here. Uh, okay. In the interest of efficiency and time and not coming back, I think we'd accept uh, the condition to get it done in summer 2017 so we could have the two-year deadline. It's going to help for our banking purposes and financing right. purposes rather than coming back in one year and then we still have kind of the unknown. We have to go through improvement plans yet. So we'd prefer to just get it done this summer as we're promising to do anyway and take the two-year extension. Thank you. All right. Okay. So you're saying condition it, Gary? Are you saying condition it that you're going to okay. clean it up sure. in 17? Okay. Okay, uh, you may need a little help, but would you like to make a motion now or what? Well, I guess with what, if I understood Gary's request, that is he wants to go back to the two-year condition because he just can't make it work in that shorter period of time. Of and, but I think he's, saying it, he's okay with uh, conditioning the cleanup in 2017. But I, I thought I heard council say we couldn't condition it. We, can we condition it? I, you know, I, I always hesitate to condition something if you can't enforce it. And when you start conditioning on clearing where you have other, other agencies that may have to do approvals where you may have weather, um, I think your better option is the one or the two year. Because remember, one of the, the main findings for an extension of time is whether the applicant has exercised due diligence in exercising the permit. So I would still recommend, if, if you are concerned about that, that you look at the, the term of your extension versus, versus a condition. Um, but Gary has a valid point. I, I hope you don't mind me mentioning yeah. that, because as a former banker, I know that the, that ex two-year extension is going to help them a lot in, uh, in securing their financing, because uh, that's just too quick a time frame for banks to feel real comfortable. So I'm sympathetic to their, their reasoning for that. Why is? I may ask, why is violating a condition not enforceable? Is your microphone on? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. What? Why is violating, you say it's not enforceable. If we go with a two-year extension and add a condition to the conditions of approval that says by a specific date, um, the, the property needs to, the, the, the structures need to be demolished or however that gets worded. How okay, is that I, unenforceable? I'm not, I'm not saying it's, it, well, I'm not saying it's unenforceable, but you have to be careful that you're, you're imposing a condition where it involves a lot of other, other issues going on. So for example, what does TRPA need to issue? I don't know. Um, but if you have other agencies that have to give approval before you end up demolishing buildings, are, are you now placing a condition that may be destined to failure because the condition doesn't allow enough latitude for the applicant to get the job done? TRPA is going to be involved in this now too, unfortunately. So, would they have an issue with knocking the buildings down? I wouldn't think so. But uh. sorry, Nick Exxon again for the applicant. We um, the, the demolition of structures um, is a qualified exempt activity with TRPA. Um, all the structures on site are over 50 years old. We've completed a historic resource determination for all structures. Um, as the photos kind of dictated, none of them are historic. And so fundamentally, once we receive, we, we have a valid demo permit with Placer County now, all we have to do to TRPA is just notify them we're demoing the buildings, but they don't have any formal review and approval process. As a result of previous, they just want to make sure that we have completed the historic resource determination, which we have. So you're willing to go ahead and demolish before you get approval of the ultimate project then? Is that what you're saying? Well, we already have approval of the ultimate project. Um, what we'd be looking at for TRPA is a permit extension um, with their permit expiring August uh, 2017. can't remember the exact date. And so we would be looking forward to getting a, an extension with TRPA. I've had conversations with them. And fundamentally, they're aware of kind of the, the, the issues that we had with financing. Um, but the movement forward as it relates to demolition um, in my conversations with TRPA would demonstrate the, the due diligence that is required to, to kind of move the process forward. Sounds like we have something working down here in the audience. 
<laughs> Did you do a little miracle? And what's the outcome of it? <laughs> Still working. <laughs> so we're, we're waiting for the brains to finish working. <laughs> spinning. <laughs> Gary Davis again, and chatting with the county council here. Uh, we would uh, celebrate a condition that said that the demolition should occur between in this construction season of 2017, and we're happy to accept that condition that the county would uh, propose on the project. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, do I hear a motion? Okay, if everyone else, if there's no one else that wants to address this, I'll move the recommendation of staff. The development review committee recommends that the planning commission approve the two year extension of time request for the 6731 Tahoe project uh, in reliance on the previously approved adopted mitigated negative declaration and conditions of approval attachment C is modified subject to the following findings. The C, uh, and one of those con ad ad added conditions is that the demolition be con done in this calendar year. Construction season. Huh? Construction season. Construction well, season. yeah. This, they could, it, we didn't have snow, they could get an extension. So at any rate, uh, yes. <coughs> And then there's also the CEQA findings and the conditions of extension of time that are listed in the agenda. What, what I may add to that is that uh, we had a new condition, you know, subject to what you said, basically demolition of the buildings shall occur prior to end of the 2017 construction season. Okay. If that's what you're saying. I think we've got a second down there. Yeah, that'll be new condition number 95. Okay. Okay. Is there any further discussion on this? Hearing none, we'll do a roll call. Okay, Mr. Curry. Yes. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Moss. Yes. Mr. Nader. Yes. Mr. Rokuchi. Yes. And Mr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for all the brain work that went on. Appreciate it. <laughs> no, it turned out pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so at this time, we, we're inviting Mr. Bruch back. Yep. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Thank okay. You. And so we're going to be talking about the North Star Mountain Master Plan. Correct. Um, good morning again. Uh, Alan Bruch uh, with the Planning Division in Tahoe. Um, we're going to have a batting order here, if you will. Um, I'm going to be presenting the project with the PowerPoints, uh, explaining the uh, North Star Master Plan project is a 20-year project. There's several components that are involved with this. There's program level and project level. Um, and then I do have our consultant is here from Ascent, uh, Patrick Angel, right here. So during my presentation, um, during it, I'm going to bring him up. There's some last-minute correspondence that you guys have. So he has reviewed it, his consulting firm, and he'll provide some comments to let you understand what those uh, responses are from staff as well as the consultant. And then we have the, the applicant, uh, Nadia uh, Guerrero will be here. She's the vice president and general manager. She will do a PowerPoint after mine, and then she'll introduce her staff and explain a little bit more detail about uh, their project and what their intent is uh, with it. So that's our batting order. Um, we do have staff here, quite a few as well. If there's some deliberation, some questions, you know, from engineering, planning staff, and again, we have the consultant here with the EIR uh, can talk further if need be. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is the North Star Mountain Master Plan. It's a general plan amendment to the Martis Valley Community Plan, land use diagram, a rezone, a zoning text amendment, and a conditional use permit. Get everyone oriented where it is. Uh, here's Highway 267, um, obviously Lake Tahoe, and the location it is in the Martis Valley area. A little portion of it is within the Tahoe Basin. I'll explain a little bit more detail what the applicant wishes to do that, what we've conditioned on that as well. Um, the site itself, the ski area, is about 5,500 uh, acres, uh, 8,000 including the residential component. You'll see in the outline there, that is the project area. Uh, their access is off 267. The zoning, it's forestry that's out there. It's TPZ, um, as well as some village commercial where the village is. 
This is an orientation of the existing mountain. You can see this is looking to the south. Lake Tahoe is right here, and it's an aerial view. So to walk you through, um, part of the uh, we're looking for, and again, this is going to go to the Board of Supervisors as a recommendation from the Planning Commission. So there is another hearing, so staff will be asking for recommendations on several actions on this particular project if you wish to uh, uh, recommend approval to the Board. Um, the conditional use permit, uh, when the applicant came to us uh, many years ago, actually, and this did this project did go in front of the Planning Commission back in 2012, initially, and there were some concerns from some neighbors, the Aspens. Um, they took a deep breath. They talked to the owners there. They had those worked out. Um, in the time being, uh, there was an errata done on the EIR um, to reflect some of those changes. But this one particularly, I'm going to talk about the entitlements. You can see here in highlighted is some of the improvements to the existing ski area, um, widening of trails, proposed snowmaking, um, and then uh, project level new lifts that will be there. And I'll scope in a little bit uh, into that. This is the Lookout Mountain area. Uh, you can see there in the orange is some of the widening um, to make it better for the trail. Um, you see in the blue there is the village and then the mid-mountain. They are providing direct lift access from the village to the top of Lookout Mountain um, to improve skier circulation and mountain access. Some of the improvements uh, over time, you know, North Star was developed in the early 70s and what they've done here is they have an interceptor lot so their clients come to that location and they have to be shuttled into the village and to other ski areas. What they're looking at as part of the conditional use permit is to provide a gondola directly out of that interceptor lot. And you can see here is Highway 267. And so they provide access directly from here so you wouldn't have to take any of the shuttle service that's there. So it provides a better direct access and skier experience. Some of the other improvements, and um, again, staff can go into more detail if need be if there's questions about it, but there's additional ski trails you see here again in orange. Um, those are gonna be improved just to make it more modern and what experiences with the skiers would like. Uh, additional ski lifts, um, you can see there's J C, J, V, W, and Z lifts will be part of this. They're not necessarily looking at building them all at once. Again, this is a master plan, a 20-year project, so it depends on financing where they feel is necessary to do those improvements. But the action we're looking for from, from staff is to provide them that clarity that this is a 20-year program, and then these would be the entitlements to allow them to do those improvements during that time. Um, other improvements as part of the conditional use permits is this, uh, the bridges. Um, providing better access again. Um, new uh, Sawmill Lake ski pod. It's a it's one lift and new trails um, that are proposed as part of this project. Snowmaking um, is a big part they need to provide. You know, for in the fall to be able to provide a base for people to come up possibly during Thanksgiving time period. They did design after working with staff and, and fire uh, where they're locating some of the snowmaking because of fire suppression during the summer as well. They were thinking outside the box, so part of this component would be the approval of that snowmaking, the location of where they are. Um, some of the key components uh, when we started reviewing this, the applicant actually did a habitat management plan. It guided them on this master plan. Uh, they came in and saw sensitive areas for biology, uh, species, migration. Um, during that study, um, they located certain areas they prefer not to, to touch, to have people go by for skiing. So because of that, um, they, dis they discovered they needed to rezone or relocate some of their areas where that development was gonna be. So I do have to say the habitat management plan that uh, we reviewed, staff reviewed, as well as the consultant, um, provided a lot of good information of where those sensitive resources are and st steering clear from them. And there is mitigation measures in the EIR that reflect this habitat management plan. And the applicant will go in a little bit more detail of what that is. 
So that's one component what staff is recommending uh, to the Planning Commission is the conditional use permit. It's actually these improvements that uh, they want to be able to do. So we are recommending to the Planning Commission to do that. The other component for the entitlements is the Martis Valley Community Plan Amendment. It would be basically swapping area that exists right now that's tourist um, resort commercial land and relocating it within their project area. It's not changing the size, it's relocating away from the more sensitive area and providing better access where they believe that's where the experience should be for the skiers and the development. The rezone also is the rezoning two existing forest zoning squares and I'll show you a map of that and then it'll be consistent with the community, uh, Martis Valley Community Plan area. And again, there is no increase or uh, of zoning, it's just relocating it. Oops. Um, this gives you a diagram of the relocation of the zoning. So it's at this location and it's swapping over here. This is the new ski area and so it's closer to that location. You can see here, because of the terrain and um, as well as the, the habitat area, it didn't make sense to keep it there for ski areas, so they're relocating it here, and that's part of the recommendation staff is making to the Planning Commission to relocate that. Uh, there, the squares we talked about as well, um, the existing zoning, the forestry zoning, it's relocating two areas from here up higher and from here up to this location. Now the zoning text amendment, there was a lot of discussion, especially from the public, because it's TPZ, TPZ zoning. Um, ski lift facilities and ski run uses, um, that's the text amendment to allow certain development of ski uh, runs and snowmaking to be allowed in the TPZ area. Um, it, we initially staff looked at it saying, okay, are we gonna do a rezone? It didn't make sense to us to say that because it allow, introduces quite a few uses into that. After talking to CDF and others, we wanna keep it TPZ. Um, we do have, there's a correspondence, uh, we did contact uh, CDF and they were okay with uh, the proposal. Um, but we also wanted to ensure uh, the TPZ zone is very specific what their development is, so any work being done in the TPZ zone would require conditional use permit, so it requires public hearings and environmental review. So that's what's happening right now at this TPZ zone, these improvements requiring this public disclosure and information. Um, there was some discussion too about the TPZ, about taxes, uh, improvements being in there. Uh, our assessor would assess those improvements. When they come in with building plans, uh, they would know about the new improvements and they would assess the property owner accordingly. So there is, uh, taxes, there was some discussion about that, but that's the county would look at it from the county assessors. Alan? Yes. Let me see on the, uh, the work that's included in this plan in the TPZ, that also is being covered in conditional use permits in this document. Correct. So you're talking about any future, is that right, work? Correct. The, the, cause it, because it's a text amendment, it's in our code, so then if the applicant comes in and says, I would like to maybe develop more of the TPZ zone, and again, I don't know if they want to or not, but if right. they did, they would come forward We say, our text amendment says it's a use permit. It's a conditional use permit. It requires planning commission review and approval. They could, you know, obviously you guys can deny it too. But the text amendment, we had to be strategic because obviously we want to make sure there's public uh, process for it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to distinguish between what we have now and what you're talking about the future. Correct, yeah. but, but there is, correct, and there is in the TPZ zone, maybe I can show here, it's in the green. You could see this area here, that is proposed in the TPZ zone as part of the conditional use permit before you today, okay. as well as in here. But, but any, any, additional, any additional ones would have to come through the public hearing. Very good point, and that's, um, there is, and I'll explain too later in the process here, there's a project level and program level review in the environmental document, mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll go into detail about that too, what staff's recommending what we reviewed. Okay. So, okay. Um, so the zoning text amendment we talked about. 
And again, this is yeah, showing you here in the blue, and this one is showing where the TPZ is. Um, now, going back to the question, um, there is program level improvements. Because you have the biologists out there, archaeology, they review the mountain, and they looked at potentially future development in that master plan area. Um, the environmental review analyzed that. However, because we're saying it's uh, program level, it doesn't have the entitlements. It's not approved. They would have to come back, additional environmental uh, review and additional entitlements, additional public hearings. So part of the environmental document does discuss program level review. And part of it is looking at several things, you know, additional parking, you know, fuel tank for generators if in case electricity goes out. Um, they're looking at uh, additional uh, skier service sites, um, as well as on the next slide here is camping, um, up to 50 people during the summer months. But again, that would come back to you. But it is analyzed uh, initially in the EIR. So because of the timing, um, the Aspen uh, Homeowner Association and, and North Star taking a breath to, to review some of the information, um, things do change. So we had to do an errata to the EIR. Uh, it wasn't certified, so we had to uh, identify. There's some changes to be made here. So these five instances, those are the five changes since uh, 2012 that we had to analyze. And that's part of your packet as in part of the errata. Um, but it is the North Star Basin retrofit I talked about, the Aspens there. Martis Valley West project, that new project came in, so we had to look at cumulative effects. Um, the amendment to the Martis Valley Community Plan, which included um, the emergency evacuation plan, um, adoption of the Clean Energy and Pollution uh, Act of 2015, and the adoption amendment of the California Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006. So, that is, again, in, in the environmental document. We will be asking for certification of the EIR in the ERA. Um, some of the items identified in the EIR and the errata, um, there are two components that are unavoidable impacts. That is being the visual impacts because of the widening of the ski lifts and the new ski lifts, as well as air quality. We have to look at the worst case scenario. It's, it's not going to happen, but we could say that all the construction can happen at once. Not in 20 years, but all at once. So, and plus the, the narrow time period when construction can happen uh, during, only during the summer. So we had to look at a worst case scenario and that's one of those unavoidables. Um, so some of the visual that we do have here, you can probably see the improvements over in this area. This is the existing, this is off Highway 267 here. This is the visual at this location. You can see the ski runs um, providing some visual, you know, more the, the trees being removed. So that is one of the unavoidables. And the next slide shows additional more details of what that is. So discussion of issues. Um, I want to highlight some of the key issues uh, that we provide, that the public provided as well as staff reviewed. Um, the habitat management plan, again, that's uh, unique. It's identifying additional areas where the master plan is going to say no development is going to be proposed at those locations. The other one is the employee housing. This was a big one for, for staff. We, as you know, we postponed this particular item to have more discussion and brain thought of, of what to do uh, about our housing up in this area. Initially, staff was looking at 100% of having construction. And then after dis further discussion with the applicant and others, there's a housing mitigation monitoring that we're going to be having the applicant submit to us. However, they're going to have to provide 75% construction. We didn't want to impose 100% because there could be employees that maybe find housing somewhere else in another neighborhood, and that's their housing. They have enough money to buy that. It really puts restrictions on staff to say 100%. Well, how do we work that out? So we, we, this is our solution. It is part of the conditions of approval to build 75% of the full-time equivalent employees. And part of this project at full build-out is 110 new full-time equivalent employees. Uh, does that include the ones they have already now, or is that an addition to 
This is in addition to. This is by the conditional use permit for the, the ski lifts um, and operations. So it's 110 was identified as full-time equivalent. So we're going to tell them that they have to build uh, 42 for those 42 employees have to be housed. Alan, could you explain that a little more? Uh, yeah. Is that going to be a monitoring program by the, by the county? And how is that going to work? I mean, what measurements do you use Good point. in evaluating this? Because, I mean, we all know that housing yeah. not, is a really hot issue up there, workforce housing. I mean, it's an issue everywhere, but, I mean, it's even more intense up there. So how are you going to monitor that? It is. Before they can do any construction, they have to provide their game plan, basically submit, submit a... Uh, a housing plan to us to show us where they're going to house it. We've been in discussion with them already because they have to find land. So they've been actually actively looking out there for where, the, where that is. They've actually, maybe they can talk a little bit more. They're participating kind of a partnership with other areas of not only their needs, but Martins Valley as well as the Tahoe area providing additional housing. But for our situation for staff, um, as part of the conditions of approval, they are obligated to submit this plan and then we look at it with our attorney to see exactly how they're meeting these obligations because um, we want to make sure they build it um, but they we want to give them we were trying to figure out maybe where is the land right now but it ties it up they don't know exactly specifically for financing because it's hard for them to move forward on something without an approved project either so they have to make sure this works out um without access to redevelopment funds, we've all been hampered by trying to come up with alternatives to housing issues, uh, again, workforce housing. Do you see this as a template maybe for the future in projects that are up in that area, how we can really kind of evaluate that, how it's being done, and how actual implementation of it yes. really works out in the real world? Correct. Absolutely, Wayne. We, we've done, um, this is kind of our pilot program for at least on our area, you know, it, it's they're demonstrating their willing partner to do the construction and they they have indicated us and we, we know they've outreached to other partners in the area to say we got a crisis we need good employees we need them to have a good place to to live and work and play basically so but the financing i mean that it, they are obligated out of their pocket on this particular project well again without redevelopment funds really it's hard for any municipality to come to the table with anything so it really requires the the organization the developer to really come up with the money and that, yes. that's really a struggle so yes. um, i don't know how we're going to actually accomplish that i i think the go-to sort of cheap way out of this is to put mitigation funds in place but i think we all question the effectiveness of that so yep. i'm glad to yep. see that we're trying to push more towards actual structures right. than just kind of throwing some dollars at it Correct. And as, as Larry and as you guys know too, we, we've looked at uh, staff in the basin secondary dwelling units right. kind of offset to allow an opportunity for somebody to, to construct those right. um, to provide some of the housing because, you know, I've been living up there for many years. It, it's next to impossible to find housing. Yeah. Well, uh, the, I know this is probably for another conversation, but I don't know that those pencil financially for the rents that you can get that these are workforce housing type of structures so uh, you know i think it, the intent is good i think in reality it's not really the best angle to try to resolve this issue right it, it is a more of a definite global issue i know that um i know there's other uh staff we're looking at the housing i think that's supposed to be going to the board here soon too i believe so there's some there's other gears working um we know it's a it's a huge issue um, but this this particular project, we we staff is comfortable that they're providing seventy five percent and allowing them the flexibility. If there's there's other ways their employees can find housing, that they we, we allow them to do that. Thank you. You bet. Just for information on that, we just adopted the regional plan, the TRPA, and for the first time, we've considered allowing two dwelling units per lot. To, to help accommodate workforce housing and it was a pretty bitter pill for trpa to <laughs> to make that step but we're they're they're trying and that, and we're looking for a way to make it work because it it does congest and, and of course in some areas like king's beach where you have 25 foot lots it's just physically impossible 
to get a building for two people or two families and park two cars it's just not going to work so there are areas that it's not going to be feasible but there's other areas where it could work and it could be uh, a benefit not only for workforce housing generally but for families that are as they become senior families they can have people come live there uh, and help them grow old <laughs> true I'm one of those <laughs> <laughs> at any rate I had another point too if you'd bear with me just for a minute could we go back to the picture of where you were switching the the uh, area from over to the e over to the west but to the to there sawmill flat yeah that's the little lake uh, the little u-shaped lake uh, sawmill lake or sawmill flat area that's the destination for uh, a trail that the county is starting to construct this spring from dollar point with the lake and that that area generally the light green area at the top is called sawmill flat and that's the lowest basin coming into the lowest summit coming into lake tahoe other than the truckee river and so that's we're coming we're going to go join north star at that location mm -hmm. and probably have campgrounds and things like that there and so that's a that's going to be a nifty area and so it's worthwhile that they're moving it from the right side over to the left side because it'll make it more practical to manage and take care of but that'll be a bike trail and ski trail uh, before long there mm -hmm. first two and a half miles will get built this summer right and, and as part of the program level that's they are looking at campgrounds there future yeah. you know that's up to them but they have to come back for approval anyway I'm sorry to interrupt you Alan. no no not at all I'm I'm good <laughs> now we got him off track we'll have to yeah yeah I had this down I had Where practice and everything now you got me off <laughs> so let's see so this is the scenic I just okay the employee housing uh, hydrology and water quality um, obviously I discussed that that was the uh, the basin retrofit project that actually is constructed and completed uh, parking and traffic this was a biggie we had a lot of people talking to staff and others of changes and more increase um, the applicant is not going I mean they have existing tickets that are out there basically what they're doing they're improving their mountain they were they're dispersing their clients out into the area more um, parking at this point um, there it, it is what's out there right now they accommodate it through tech, ticket sales um, and this particular project what they're looking for is basically dispersing their existing clients that would be up in the mountain area so it is something that was evaluated in the EIR and staff reviewed it you know we did have some questions ourselves about this um, but then we did see there there because of the crowding that's occurring right now in the existing areas um, it makes it unfeasible for a good experience where people come up for Tahoe to go skiing and so what they're doing here is they're just accommodating making it easier more accessible more modern and then the emergency evacuation plan this was a lot of discussion on other projects too mm -hmm. they do have their emergency evacuation plan which we have reviewed as well as uh, North Star fire um, it does meet the new policies that went into uh, into play so it does comply with the recent policy additions to the Martis Valley Community Plan that was in front of the board the timber production zone I did touch on that um, it does allow for alternative uses uh, at that location I talked about the taxes um, and the improvements that are there North Star will go into some more details because when we reviewed this we did discover the TPZ zone and other jurisdictions they allow this kind of operation ski areas ski runs um, in the TPZ uh, the only ski facility um, that is in Placer County that has TPZ is North Star. So this is specific, even though our zoning text amendment um, is talking about TPZ, the only areas that it does affect is, is North Star. So correspondence received, and this is where I'll have Patrick uh, come up and talk about what we received and provide a little bit of information on it. Um, but NITRAC uh, did recommend approval uh, this was uh, quite some time ago though did recommend uh, approval of the amendments uh, the conditional use permit 
There was a couple uh, of the members, they wanted to review the EIR a little bit more in detail, um, but it's a thick document, um, but it was uh, recommended for approval. But I have Patrick here, he can talk about those recent correspondence, and you should have as well some of the noise information. His consulting firm provided that in writing, some of the correspondence, but here's Patrick. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Johnson, Commissioners. Again, my name is Pat Angel. I'm the project manager uh, for the EIR for the Mountain Master Plan. Just a really quick background on myself. I've actually managed uh, all of the major um, projects in North Star since 2000, so I've got a bit of history on how all this has evolved. So uh, in your packet was provided some comment letters uh, that are late and uh, some of them do touch on environmental issues and I wanted to briefly go over these. Certainly if you have any questions, stop me or wait till the end. Uh, but the first letter was from a gentleman by the name of William Bankta who brought up issues associated with TPZ issues. Uh, in regards to the environmental aspects, he was arguing that the EIR doesn't address uh, the fact that these facilities are going into TPZ land, doesn't address the compatibilities and the impacts of that. Uh, he made these comments before uh, in the draft EIR, and those comments were responded to in the final. He largely re reiterates these issues, but to, to clarify, we, we did relook at this issue yet again and acknowledge there really isn't a consistency with timber harvesting and a ski resort operation. They frankly happen at two different times during the year if you're going to if you're going to be doing an active timber harvest. Uh, in regards to environmental impacts, the EIR looks extensively at what happens in regards to the tree removal for water quality, for air quality. Uh, the, uh, there's a mitigation measure 6-9 that actually requires North Star to replace habitat that's lost on a one-to-one -one ratio within North Star as part of their habitat management plan. Uh, one other item that was brought up associated with the zoning text amendment was uh, the concern that given the way it's written now, it allows other resorts, and, and uh, Alan's correct that North Star is the only, one, only ski resort in Placer County that has TPZ land within its boundaries. However, Alpine Meadows, Squaw Valley, uh, Royal Gorge, and Sugar Bowl all have TPZ lands adjoining their boundaries. So you could have a circumstance where they acquire that land and may be interested in putting ski facilities in there. The important thing to realize is the zoning tax amendment only allows it as a conditional use. It's not an old use allowed by, by right. So these resorts couldn't just acquire TPZ land and start throwing up facilities. They have to come for a conditional use permit that may or may not be approved by the county. That triggers environmental review. It's speculative for us to guess if any of these resorts would take uh, this opportunity. Currently, there aren't any applications before the county on any of, these resort, any of these resorts looking at use of TPZ land. Uh, he also expressed a concern about a mitigation measure uh, dealing with uh, migratory birds and that there wasn't a, a standard to address that. And frankly, it appears to be a misread of what the mitigation measure says. It applies the same uh, mitigation requirements to raptors to migratory birds because it, it pretty much you, you deal with them in the same sort of way. Uh, there are also a comment letter from the Friends of the West Shore that uh, expressed similar concerns that, that uh, Mr. Bankta did on the TPZ, so I won't re-elaborate on those. They did express their concerns that there are going to be uh, impacts to the Tahoe Basin associated with this project. Both the draft and the final EIR talk about that in regards to what possible impacts the, the project has into the Lake Tahoe Basin, how much traffic we're putting down into the Lake Tahoe Basin. Uh, and then recently there was a letter submitted by uh, North Star Village Association which brought up two issue areas. They brought up noise and traffic and in your materials I believe you got a uh, memo from Ambient that explained the noise issue but I will highlight the items he brought up in regards to noise. Uh, the first was uh, concerns about how the noise survey was done. Basically uh, Ambient went out and took some noise measurements back in January 2013 to get a condition of what noise is currently like in regards to the operations uh, where the proposed J-lift would be. And it was expressed a concern that this analysis didn't look at and document uh, a concern associated with the existing noise operation of the existing gondola. Uh, what was responded to in the memo back was the purposes of the survey was just to get the noise data. It wasn't to determine whether or not an existing operation is meeting county noise standards or not. Uh, and that information didn't come into play in regards to how we did the noise analysis for the proposed J-lift, which is adjoining the gondola and the nearest to, to the residents. 
Now, unlike the existing gondola, the proposed J-lift um, facility is going to have its drive facilities located on the top of the mountain, not at the bottom of the mountain. At the time we did the EIR, we weren't sure where their backup generators were going to be located, so uh, ambience analysis looked at them being at the bottom of the mountain because that would be the worst case, be the closest to residents. Even with that location as part of their emergency operation, they would not exceed county noise standards. Regular operation also won't exceed uh, county noise standards. They also expressed a desire by the commission to address this existing noise issue associated with the existing operation, the gondola. Certainly a, you know, a legitimate concern, and I can understand that. However, uh, in regards to the environmental review of this proposed project, CEQA doesn't give you the ability to basically address pre-existing issues. You can only evaluate and address and mitigate the impacts of the project before you. Uh, in regards to traffic, there were some concerns brought up in regards to how the existing traffic operations at the drop-off of the village operates. The important thing to realize here is the EIR focuses on the impacts of the project on the peak hour traffic conditions when the parking lots are full and what that means in regards to level of service operations. While it's understandable, yeah, you know, pick up and drop off during these peak periods are going to maybe be occasionally congested or maybe inconvenience, really doesn't change the conclusions in which the EIR looked at. And then finally, there was a uh, email received from uh, uh, Daniel, uh, and I might botch the last pronunciation of his last name, but I think it's pronounced Kasabian. And he expressed concerns in regards to traffic analysis in regards to when the traffic counts were done. He, he basically noted he didn't think enough sites, enough locations were looked at, and the period of time it wasn't looked at. In the final EIR, we, we documented the history in regards to how the traffic counts and analysis was done. Uh, traffic counts have been Traffic and parking count data has been collected at North Star since 2000. And so what we did is we looked at what was the 30th worst condition, which corresponds to when the parking lots are full at North Star. So the, the data that was used to analyze the, uh, the impacts of the project was basically uh, corresponds to data that was collected on January 5th, 2011. Parking lots were full, and it was the second busiest day that North Star has had so far on record. So we're really comfortable that we're covering the, uh, the peak condition of traffic. And with that, I am happy to answer any further questions or elaborate on any of the points I've talked about today. Patrick, I have a question. Um, there's a lot of moving elements in this, in this uh, project, you know, with uh, new, new trails, relocated trails, new ski lifts, remodeled ski lifts. But just as a, as a, as a percentage-wise, we have a lot of development already up on the mountain counting everything if you were to put a percentage increase in the activity or development of, for this project if it was built out what would that be it would be five percent ten percent i mean just just, just i'm not going to hold you to this i just kind of i'm an electrical engineer and like this is a lot of moving parts and you can analyze every every one but i kind of get a like a, an overall uh, picture of it yeah, I interesting because part of what they're also doing is they're repurposing existing ski trail runs. That's right. So they're, well, they're let's not count those then. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about some very fringe elements that are being added adjoining to the the resort. And we did, um, our firm did do a thorough peer review of their habitat management plan because much of how the the project was designed was based on the habitat management plan and what's best for your remaining forest conditions on the North Star property and definitely can attest that it does an excellent job of really looking at your old growth forest conditions where your your most critical resources are. So while it's 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 on the edges of that, it's certainly adjoining existing facilities. It's, it's hard to throw a percentage number on that. I, on, I honestly okay. haven't looked at the numbers that way. It's about 420 acres of trees are coming out in, in total with the entire master plan, which you know, it's, it's a big number. But there's, there's a lot of commitment in the habitat management plan, a lot of work they're already doing to improve the, um, the, the forest conditions on, on the remaining areas. Okay, well, thank you. That satisfies my, my question. Okay, one, thank you. One comment, oh. maybe, um, I hate to bring this up, is it because it's, it's kind of painful, but recently the traffic situation seems to be getting a little bit more intense. I, uh, I remember in the early days there was 
a, a set number that we worked towards and then the sign went up that the parking lot was full and no more cars and people could come in. I don't know if that's still being used. I haven't heard or seen of it in, in the recent years, but I have heard a fair number of people uh, in, the, in the recent weekends who have uh, started to go skiing at North Star with season passes and got there and didn't get on the hill until 1.30 or 2 o'clock. And I, and I guess one of the things that comes to me, comes to mind is the, the, uh, the building of the new lift from the parking lot, number one, from the parking lot to the base of the hill. And number two, is, is that parking lot now limited to its current size or is, is that potentially uh, expandable in the future as other lands close to the hub of the, or the center of the, of the operation uh, get used for resi residential uses in, in there and hotels and shopping and whatever. Because I, I, think, I think we need to really look hard at it, maybe expanding the day use facility, I don't know, or limiting it somehow or whatever you're, you might suggest to mitigate that issue. Yeah, I'll, I'll let uh, the folks from Vail comment about the ability to expand their existing okay. parking. I mean, they're, they're current, they currently have 2,500 parking spaces they use for, for day skier. Now, of course, if you have a storm that's hitting at the same time that you have a lot of skiers coming up and you have icy road conditions, they probably can't maximize their parking their ability because, well, you've got icy roads, so you're going to want to space the cars out a little further. Um, the interesting thing to, to, to keep in mind is one thing that's evolved up in North Star is uh, part of this project is to accommodate the approximate 2,600 units that have been approved in the North Star and the Mars Camp area. Basically, people who are, they're not day skiers, they're, they're staying there, you know, they're walking out of their, their, uh, their unit, they're getting into a, a shuttle, hopefully, <laughs> and, you know, going up onto the lift. So you've got more um, extended stay people who are there who are now utilizing the mountain than you've had, or you have that capability that you haven't had in the past since 2000. Yeah, I, I came down Saturday for a funeral here in Auburn, and uh, as I came over 267 and got to North Star, I thought I couldn't figure out what had happened, and the traffic was backed up onto the interstate from North Star. And so I think one thing we need to think about is the potential of getting the people in sooner and, and settled and then let somehow notify them that you know we have we don't have room for any more because they had the, the highway was bumper to bumper to the freeway and i was saddened to see that that was oh i guess it was about 11 o'clock on saturday morning uh, and it, it looks like that lift is if one thing would be a, a big help would be the transport lift in the house to get that um, functioning and then to uh, somehow, and I think this squaw is having the same problem uh, on 89, uh, similar situation. So I think we as a county need to try to find ways to help that industry solve that parking problem uh, somehow. I'm not sure whether it's going to be with buses or, or just what it is, but uh, I think it's going to give a, the business a black eye, which we'd like to avoid, uh, if possible, people are start, going to start saying, you know, I'm not going to go, it's just impossible to navigate there. On the Larry, are you saying it was backed up the Interstate 80? Yeah. All the way to North Star? Yeah. Good grief. Uh, <laughs> I'd give up. Well, I'm just saying it's, 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 it's too bad because it gives the industry a bad name. And, and I don't, we don't need to give the industry a bad name. We need to try to solve these problems. And, and maybe it's going to be a parking facility in Truckee yep. and busing know. those people over. I don't know. Uh, it's difficult to get people to get out of their car and take their skis and boots and the kids and coats and all the junk they take and get them to get on a bus and, and then go to the ski area. and 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 then reverse the process at the end of the day. But somehow, uh, I think we need to make this, as long as we're looking at a master plan, if there's, if there's areas that would be
be suited for uh, helping that situation, I think we should try to include those in this process if we can. I'll shut up for a while. Big parking lot around the airport. <laughs> well, the airport might might be a, a, a feasible solution to that. I'm not sure what it is. I know uh, the town of Truckee has been somewhat critical of us, you know, with North Star and all the things we've done in, in yeah, we're Squaw Valley. But they're building new stuff like crazy themselves. Sure, and so the it's, <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's uh, a tough, tough nut to crack. It, it is. Um, you know, like I mentioned, it, this particular project, it's, a, it's improving the existing, you know, ski facilities and exp allowing the crowds to spread out. Um, and I do know I've got, I got teenagers that ski, and it's pent up energy, too. I mean, we haven't had this kind of snow in a number of years, and the economy's improving, and everyone's just got this drive, and it happens all at once. Um, but, but this particular project, like I said, it, it is, um, we did review the, the parking, and the, the, as you mentioned, Larry, the, the gondola out of there, the interceptor lot. I mean, it's to accommodate those experiences. They're trying to make it better rather than waiting in traffic and stuff. So. Yeah, the, the, sad, the sad part of it is the <laughs> buses that go from the interceptor lot up to the center of town, they get caught in the traffic. Right. And so these people are sitting there all frustrated in a bus not going anywhere and I know one friend said well I tried to get off the bus and the bus driver wouldn't let me <laughs> off and so that really made him mad but at any rate uh, that's sort of self-defeating when you when you're uh, trapped in a bus and you look up on the mountain and it's a beautiful sunny day and you want to get up there right uh, I in the applicant they do have their parking plan they can talk a little bit more in detail yeah, yeah. about that too for the Commission to let them know what they're looking at but again they're it's the same issue. They want to make sure their clients come back and oh, sure. they're not, you know, waiting in line. Um, well, uh, you know, obviously, you know, this is a great plan to try to create some efficiency in the, in the project, and that's outstanding. But 267 is 267, and that's not getting better. And I don't, you know, that's, you know, I've been on that soapbox before, but, uh, you know, we can create the best plan on the up in the hills but as long as we have the restrictors of 267 and 89 we got a nightmare right okay let me see alan i have one more question sure for uh for patrick yeah sure go right ahead okay yeah we're going back to uh tpz and <coughs> forestry too mm -hmm. and uh yeah I, I have to admit that i'm a forester so i kind of pick out certain words in the document and uh, yeah, I don't really have a problem with uh, the determination that uh, Cal Fire has made, and the, the fact that uh, you know ski areas, I mean ski ski runs and ski lifts are okay in the TPZ, and uh, the, the fact that uh, Cal Fire has said that uh, basically this helps to preserve TPZ lands where otherwise they'd be pulling out. But I did notice in the document that there's several places where we talk about encouraging prudent and responsible forest resource management. And uh, those words really sound real nice, but the metric or, you know, what are we talking about there? Well, the, um, when those statements are made, they're often made in regards to the North Star Habitat Management Plan that has, uh, and, you know, we could spend a whole day talking about what the, the, the details and the concept of, of, of what that, um, that plan does in regards to both you know, habitat improvement as well as forest improvement. Um, it includes several things in regards to, you know, management, selective, you know, selective clearing, um, uh, monitoring, uh, restrictions and operations, uh, both in regards to the ski resort as well as the summer uses when they've got, for example, deer coming through in its fawning season. Um, so, uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg of, of many of the things. I'm, I'm sure the, the applicant could speak far better to the the nitty gritty and what they have been doing since they've had the uh, habitat management plan because I think it's been in what 2010 I think is when the habitat management plan was first developed 2009, 2009. yeah I think well maybe I would want to hear some more I you know I think it actually applies to uh, the existing ski area lands where uh, you have ski trails now 
and uh, the other TPZ lands that we're talking about where we're building ski trails we're managing the forest and mm -hmm. and uh, you know the view I have of course is you know forestry is a, a long-term game and the forest is a dynamic system and so changes are always happening and uh, particularly in, in this type of country where you have red fur typically uh, you know the ski runs are going to seed in with uh, trees and uh, changes are going to happen you know the old trees die and get logged and and that type of thing so at any rate I guess what my question will deal with is kind of a long-term game and how is that really uh, accomplished or you know how is it controlled or whatever by the ski area okay. so maybe that yeah, answer is coming in yeah the I, again the, okay. you know the applicants I, I, I can I can attest that by our consulting firm, our review of it, it basically addresses the impacts associated with this project mm -hmm. uh, in regards to the nitty gritty of exactly um, how it's managed. How, how they're doing it. Yeah. They, they can speak better at that than I can. Okay, thank you. Okay, our batting uh, uh, program here. We're so I got a couple other minor things to talk about. I shouldn't say they're minor. But it's something you should be aware of that did come up as part of the discussion is a small portion of this particular project is within the Tahoe Basin. Um, you can see there in the blue, uh, that is part of the project area that is in the basin. So part of the project, um, and there is conditions in the conditions of approval, they do require TRPA approval and review, their own environmental analysis as well. Um, but you can see there is a building that's over on the other side of the ridge there, and some of the proposed snowmaking is just over the ridge. So um, this is something that we've analyzed and reviewed. Um, it requires additional approvals. Um, we looked at it at the environmental uh, impacts. Um, it meets what we define as um, part of the lodge there is, is allowed. Um, so we would have them go through design site review contingent upon getting TRPA approval on that particular uh, project. So there has been some discussion about uh, the project in the Tahoe Basin. You can see here what exactly that is. So if, that, if there's any questions about that during public testimony, we can go into more detail if necessary. But I just want to let you know there is a portion, there is a small portion within the Tahoe well, Basin. That, uh, Alan, will that be part of our uh, recommendation regarding the condition use permits? Correct. Okay. That is correct. And so then subsequently we'd have a TAPR, TRPA review. That, that is correct. We would not approve any improvement plans or any building permits for, or grading for that matter in the basin unless we get TRPA approval. Okay. And they show us that they got that. Okay. And they were in close concert with their staff too to see exactly that we're talking and making sure it's the same plans too. Um, so with that, um, the recommendations, there's several, and I have this at the end of the PowerPoint after the, the applicant, if you desire to recommend to the Board of Supervisors, but um, I was going to read them out, but uh, because of the timing and everything, I'm sure it's in the staff report, um, and again, it's at the end of the PowerPoint, but there's several actions we are looking at and making sure that you take action on the errata. Uh, the mitigation monitoring program, the findings of fact, statement of overriding considerations, um, and then the text amendments and rezoning that's necessary um, in making sure that the attachments are associated with those recommendations. So there's five actions that staff is looking for, again, to recommend to the Board of Supervisors. Um, and with that, I got uh, Nadia uh, Guerrero is going to be here. She'll introduce her staff, and then the applicant has their presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Nadia Guerrero, and I was recently named Vice President and General Manager of North Star Ski Resort, um, North Star California, back in early December. Um, I've been part of the resort since 2007. Um, and I'm thrilled to be in this seat presenting the master plan, something I've been personally involved with uh, for, for a decade now. Um, this morning I, I will briefly reintroduce the resort um, and then ask my planning team to walk you through the master plan in more detail. North Star opened in 1972 
offering some of the best skiing and winter snow sports to the region. Through the years, we have evolved into a family-friendly resort with a relaxed style that's unique to the region. Uh, in 2010, we were acquired by Vail Resorts um, as the second resort in Tahoe along with Heavenly. Our North Star brand is focused on combining California cool with a sophisticated alpine experience and unprecedented guest service. Over the expected life of the master plan, we want to further imp improve the guest and employee experience by taking the mountain to the next level with the North Star Master Plan. The master plan presented before you today is designed to be a resort roadmap for the next two decades, intended to encourage longer guest stays, accommodate the existing and approved lodging and residential units, and retain our competitive edge as a premier destination resort. Our plan provides guests and residents with a wider, more diverse array of terrain offerings, new ski lifts, and on-mountain services. Together, these enhancements will bring an improved and extended vacation experience for the destination and day use guest. Our master plan does not include additional on-site lodging, real estate, or day use parking. The plan consists of on-mountain recreational and skier service improvements. Our goal is to provide experiences of a lifetime for our guests and employees. This plan reinforce, reinforces our ability to do this properly and thoughtfully. For several years, we've worked closely with community stakeholders, and we will continue to do so to meet the changing needs of the ski industry, environmental priorities, and community issues. Unless you have any questions for me, I'd like to introduce Andrew Strain, who is our VP, uh, Vice President of Planning and Governmental Affairs, to walk you through the master plan in more detail. We do have other members of our uh, North Star Planning and Operations team here today to respond to your questions, and they include Jerusha Hall, Jen Mater, Scott Sibilia, and Beth Collins Brigard, our counsel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. I'm Andrew Strain with North Star. Thank you for arranging the special meeting today uh, to hear this item. I also want to thank the staff for their hard work and, and frankly, their stick to itiveness. We've had a lot of changes over the time since we were first uh, before you on both the staff side and on our side, too, as you can tell. And we appreciate uh, the continued effort on the part of your staff. You're very well served. I want to talk to you about the master plan briefly and try and answer your questions and some of those that have been raised. We believe that a master plan is the right approach for this particular project. It's a 20-year vision. It's an overall plan for the improvement of the mountain oriented at our guests, particularly our destination guests, in line with the additional real estate inside the resort that's already been approved and is being built out right now by the, our real estate partner. It also outlines our capital investment strategy. We are a company that invests a lot of capital in our resorts. Uh, North Star was resort number six in the uh, company when it was acquired 2010, 2011. We have 13 now. So the competition internally for capital has grown, as you can imagine, significantly. So having a master blueprint and a long-term roadmap on how we intend to improve the resort to meet our guest needs is a right thing to do internally as well. The other thing that we see as a benefit for the master plan is it allows us to communicate with our stakeholders. Placer County is a stakeholder. The communities, Kings Beach, Truckee, Tahoe City, Tahoe Vista, Donner Lake, those are all stakeholders in our business and in our community. And we think this is the right tool to help do that with. You've heard earlier uh, about the Habitat Management Plan. Commissioner Johnson uh, has some specific questions. This is it, the Habitat Management Plan, as it was first drafted. I'll say a little bit about it, and if that doesn't answer your questions, the, uh, the keeper of our Habitat Management Plan from our team is here today, and I know she would be happy to go into much greater depth uh, and knowledge, which she has, than I do. The other thing that the master plan does for us 
it allows us some flexibility to respond to changes in market conditions. We know, and, I, and you, you've probably heard me say this before, in the ski industry it's well known that it is easier and less expensive to keep an existing customer than it is to go out and find a new customer. So from that standpoint, a master plan that has some phasing flexibility for us to allow us to choose uh, based on the market preferences, which do change over time, as you all know, uh, that is a benefit of the master plan. Nadia mentioned, and the staff mentioned too, we want to remain competitive. We, the Sierra, are competing against Utah, Idaho, Montana, Colorado, Canada for the destination dollar. The, the consumer today has so many choices compared to years ago on where they can go and what they can do with their free time and their discretionary income that it encourages or it really forces competition to make sure that your resort offers that set of amenities and facilities to create the experiences for people. And that's very important in our industry. And that is the primary objective of the master plan through a series of different facilities and different development opportunities on the mountain. The habitat management plan is another key objective, as I've mentioned. It really was used as a design determinant to help direct and structure where the improvement should be and, in fact, where they should not be. And we think this is somewhat groundbreaking in the ski industry uh, and are looking at that at our other resorts as a best practice to use in terms of master planning. A variety of experiences. North Star, as, as Commissioner Sevison knows, was developed first in the early 70s, and the preferences and the ability levels and the time that people want to ski and what they want to do while they're skiing and snowboarding, which was never part of the equation, that's changed over time. So we're looking to provide that variety to meet our consumers' preferences and, their, frankly, their demands. I'm going to hand out to you a trail map that I have just because this map, frankly, reads a little better than some of the maps that we assembled as the master plan documents. I'll summarize what is in the master plan today, and it has changed over time. It just helps to look at the mountain from that perspective, I think, is a little easier to see than some of the maps that we have. Today we have 20 lifts and an approval for some ski school surface lifts that haven't been built yet that are short, low elevation, low angle in nature to help improve our ski school facilities. We're proposing to build five new area lifts, which means chair lifts, a new transport gondola, which was mentioned, Commissioner Sevison mentioned it, coming in from our remote parking to the village, and then one new surface lift. That's a handle tow lift or a platter pull once upon a time, they were called by the name of the manufacturer, a POMA lift. It's a low level uh, surface toe that is on the ground and not up in the air. You ski along in a track with it. Anybody ever grew up learning to ski on a rope toe? It's a modern version of a rope toe. It doesn't thrash your gloves or turn you upside down. We today have 100 named ski trails, 650 acres. Uh, the total skiable acres is 3,170. This is a year where you can ski all 3,170 of those acres. Sierra resorts in general ski very small in the lean years, which we've had plenty of. When there is above, ad above average snowfall like there is this year, it, the ski areas ski much bigger. We're proposing to add 25 new named trails organized around some additional lifts. Lift plus trails, I think you've heard me describe together, is in the industry that's called a pod where you have the lift uphill capacity designed to balance with the downhill capacity of the trails so that it's an enjoyable experience. And there are some industry standards that we've come to learn over the years. That ends up being about 175 acres and 400 acres of new uh, gladed skiing. That is selective removal of trees. That's not edge-to-edge -edge cleared of a run, but that's thinning, which provides obviously some forest health benefit opportunities too if you do it wisely. Our skiers and other skiers love to ski in the trees. North Star is known in the industry as having some of the great tree skiing, which is a different experience than out on a developed ski run. It's uh, more about being in the backcountry almost. You tend to slow down. I was going to say, until you hit a tree, it's a good experience. <laughs> You'd be surprised, uh, Commissioner. 
the skiing actually is safer out there because people relax and it's not a speed race from top to bottom. Uh, and you enjoy being out in it more, particularly folks that uh, also like to go backcountry or cross-country skiing. They appreciate that as an experience. Today we've got 46 uh, trails with snowmaking or that already have it approved, 400 acres in total, and we're proposing to add snowmaking to 13 of the existing trails that are on the map today, and then 12 of the new ski trails to add over time, 20 years, about 300 acres. Today we have five on-mountain lodges, we're proposing to add three new on-mountain lodges, really much smaller, downsized to be strategically placed warming huts. That's part of the moving the zoning squares around that uh, Alan mentioned to you earlier in the rezone and the master plan amendment for the Martis Valley. And then we would expand the existing summit deck and grill. That's an existing facility top of the mountain. Today we have uh, 24, 2,500 parking spaces. I'll talk about that a little more coming up. Uh, and we would propose, as we move the cross-country center up to Sawmill Flat Reservoir, we'd propose to add its own dedicated parking for that. We would serve it with our internal North Star Transit system, and then also have some spaces up there for folks who really just want to go have that cross-country skiing experience. It's not a huge money maker, but it absolutely is part of the package. Uh, for folks who like to cross country, and we're finding that families now come for the whole experience. Kids might be in ski school, young adults would be skiing or snowboarding. The older folks, the parents or the grandparents, they'd love to get out and snowshoe or cross country. That's that range of experiences that families can have in the same location so that you're spending time with your kids, which as you know, is invaluable as you get older. This master plan summary sheet that you just had up on the deal that answered my previous question is that is in the, in the sense of how much do we have now and, and how much are we adding by those different categories. So that was a good sheet. Good. It made sense to me anyway. Uh, using your trail map as uh, a locator, that's probably the best way to look at it. Down at the bottom of the map is the village. There's a mid-mountain area that's near the gondola. E.J., I'm going to borrow. And uh, this is the map that uh, Alan showed you individual portions of it. The areas that are shown in red are the new trails, the lift alignments, I'm sorry, the new lifts. And the areas that are shown in that uh, burnt orange or rust colored are the new trails. In looking at your master plan, we have uh, a new lift coming out of the village that would parallel the Highlands gondola down in the lower left, go up past the Ritz-Carlton and land near the call out that's for the Northwest Territory. We want a better way to get people up the mountain in a redundant way so we don't deliver them all to the same exact place, which is the Big Springs Lodge. That's the way almost everybody goes up the mountain today. Gives us a chance to spread them out. That's the J lift. That has new terrain associated with it as well and a mid station so that you can do laps skiing back to the mid station. On the very left side of the trail map, you'll see a lift called the Vista Express. That's on our map uh, on the screen. To the left of that is where we would propose the new sea pod of terrain. That's a traditional ski trail and lift up. It's on the very left side and would come down to the reservoir, the lake that Larry mentioned earlier, where the trail, the summer trail, will go, the Martis Valley to Tahoe Trail. We have run widening proposed across the older part of the mountain to help widen some of those trails that were built in the early 70s that were built for a pair of head 360 skis that had absolutely no side cut and it would, they were essentially one person wide trails. Preferences have changed. We have shaped skis to help people ski longer and more enjoyably into their older age. We have snowboards that have a different turning radius and we want to widen some of those existing trails that were very narrowly cut back then because that was the standard of the day and it's changed. We have a new pot of terrain if you look to the lower right of the mountain that's called Lookout Mountain that exists today. Those trails are actually built to modern standards because it's uh, not that old, it's about 10 years old. To the right of that we're proposing the Q lift and trail pot. That would be a backcountry experience where we've gladed the trails and not cut clear trails edge to edge. 
great openings there now, natural forest openings, and we take advantage of those in laying that out. We think that also helps uh, mitigate visual effects too when seen from a distance. It's a way to feather edges, vary the width of the trail. You can employ some forestry practices and landscape architectural practices to help improve what those look like from a distant viewpoint. It's done very regularly with uh, Forest Service and federal land type of ski areas. On the backside, where we have the existing backside lift, you can see that in the upper right portion of your trail map where it says the backside and then there's an existing lift. Those are some trails that we'd like to widen to over time. Same idea is that they were built before shaped skis, they were built before snowboards, and frankly, you can have a couple of people wide skiing the trail simultaneously and not have an issue with congestion. Then out to the far right, where you'll see right at the very right-hand edge of your trail map, a place identified as Sawtooth Ridge. It's beautiful terrain out there that we could go out there this time of year and pull people out in a snowcat or groom a snowcat path out for them to get to, and they would have a terrific gladed backcountry experience and then be able to ski back. We'd like to add a lift and a trail pod to that using those same gladed techniques to let people get out there. North Star is short from a balance standpoint on intermediate skiing and expert skiing. This layout helps us improve those situations. We're great on the low ends, the novice, the beginner, the low intermediate, and we're pretty good on the advanced intermediate between kind of between medium rare and rare almost, if you think of it that way. We're really short on advanced terrain. Uh, compared to some of our competition, and we're pretty short on the intermediate terrain, too. So those are the designs. Each one of these improvements, it's fair to say, that we're making has a specific objective or purpose to meet a need we don't believe we have today. The Sawtooth Ridge area, Alan mentioned it as well. This is an opportunity to really go into a beautiful partially forested area and take advantage of the openings to create some new gladed trails with tree islands. We have many existing trails today at North Star with tree islands. Have some great forestry benefits, visual purposes, and people love that experience. This is kind of the feel for what it is out there when you're in uh, gladed skiing. And people do slow down. You'd be surprised. I want to talk for a minute about the partnerships in developing the master plan. Uh, prior to Vail Resorts acquiring North Star, the previous team, who, who some of you have known and worked with, worked very closely with uh, two of our leading conservation groups in the Martis Valley and North Tahoe Truckee area, the Mountain Area Preservation Foundation and Sierra Watch. They helped design the plan and looked at it. They really helped us design the habitat management plan. Near the end of the planning process, we asked them to tell us if they felt that the master plan was um, consistent with the principles and practices in the habitat management plan. Uh, a group called the Conservation, Conservation Biology Institute, CBI, uh, was hired as a third party independent to look at the two and determine that there was consistency between the master plan as it was designed and the principles and the goals of the habitat management plan. You may hear that from them today as part of public comment. This is the beginnings of the habitat management plan. It's it, essentially, it's a zoning plan for the mountain based on the natural resource values. It's ranked from A through E. The village is down on the lower left where the big letter A is. The bulk of the mountain is in zone C or zone B. The most suitable for development are zones A, B, and C. The least suitable for development or most valuable for conservation are zones D and E. The master plan responds to that sensitivity ranking. You can see on the left hand side of the, just underneath the title block on this side, on this slide, what the design determinants were that went into the habitat management plan. Resource identification, really, and protection. Late seral forest enhancement. How do we help the old growth stay healthy and get older quicker for the values it provides? Wildlife protection for our key indicator species. Forestry management practices when we actually do either 
forest health projects or when we do go out to begin to implement the master plan and develop the ski trails. And lastly, what are our design and construction best practices from a water quality protection standpoint? The idea of water quality best management practices that Commissioner Sevison and I have dealt with for what seems like our entire adult lives uh, on the basin side of the boundary, we use them here. It's the right thing to do. This is a, a map showing what we actually have done and it's important for us to recognize that the North Star Community Service District and the North Star Fire Department are partners of ours in forest health protection. You can see there is the map again of North Star, the work that we have done since 2005 shown in the rust colored polygons and the blue polygons. The work that North Star, Fuel, North Star Fire has done in and around the village and the real estate development areas is shown in green. It's a partnership. And frankly, I think it's going as well as probably any public-private partnership that I've been involved with in terms, we have the same goals. They have their priority areas, we have our priority areas. And we work together and communicate about what those are. You gotta keep at it though. You can't just do it once and say we're done. You have to go back, I think Commissioner Johnson mentioned that, that forests grow. And you have to continue to treat them. Uh, they've really been North Star Fire amazing about taking care of the wooey or the halo around the developed parts of the community where the real estate and the lodges are. Here's some more information about some of the practices that are contained in the habitat management plan that I've already mentioned. Resource mapping, resource protection from our stream and riparian areas. We do have seasonal closures. I think someone mentioned uh, deer migration. Late serial forest enhancement, I'm happy to have our staff explain some in more detail if you'd like that. We do surveys annually. We have both forestry practices and then design construction practices that uh, are for our improvements that we build. And lastly, one of the great things, it's a partnership with the NAPOA North Star Property Owners Association and some real weed warrior champions is invasive weed management. We know that's part of the puzzle that you've got to deal with. The conservation easements that we do have in place today are held by the Truckee Donner Land Trust. This is an, an element that I wanted to make sure and covered for you because I know it's come up as an important public policy discussion since uh, particularly the summer and fire season. North Star has always had an emergency evacuation plan. We've never been asked to share it before or talk to people about it, so uh, we're happy to do that. We have an existing plan today, uh, Scott Sevilla, who's here, he is our health and safety manager. He's our point person for implementing that. Again, it's a partnership with the North Star Fire and actually on the basin side to the North Lake Tahoe Fire District. We do keep the snowmaking system charged and operational in the summer. It's perfect water supply for the forest. All ski areas do this now. Heavenly does it, Kirkwood does it, everybody who's around a population center, it's the right thing to do to provide an extra layer of protection that nobody used to think about, frankly. The, there's an annual drill that's conducted with the local fire department, that's North Star Fire and North Tahoe Fire. Uh, there's the fuels reduction work, and you can see the statistics on that, to help reduce uh, fire and fuel loads uh, in and around North Star. And what we've done recently is we have gained approval from Cal Fire of a long-term timber harvest plan for the entire resort that's aimed at fuels management. We've just started to implement that this last summer. That was a good document to get in place. Does that cover the whole, whole, yes, the whole holdings of the... Yes, uh, of us, yes. Huh? It, covers, it covers the whole holdings of our, of our landowner, CNL, yes. That's correct. Of the, the, of, no, of the resort. Uh -huh. uh, uh, it does not care, cover the private lands that we don't own or control. Those areas that were on the map, Commissioner, in green for treatment, those are covered by a separate, I believe, a separate THP that North Star Fire has. So I think between our area of coverage and their area of coverage, I think we've got the whole resort covered, which is about 8,000 acres. Okay. That partially answers one of my questions. Good. Okay. Uh, uh, that concludes the remarks I have made. I wanted to at least uh, respond to Commissioner Sevison. I saw last night uh, on the Channel 3 KCRA news the weatherman Mark Finan report what was expected to be shown today when they did the, the monthly, the state did the monthly snow survey. Uh, our part of the Sierra, which they classify as the central Sierra, 175% of average snow 
uh, fall or standing snow on the ground for this date of Feb Groundhog Day. Mm -hmm. um, it's an extraordinary year in Tahoe. If we were before you two years ago, we could throw a rock and not hit a customer. We realize that we are in extraordinary, this is an extraordinary season based on the timing of when the snow came, based on the amount of people who have been pent up demand, I think someone else mentioned that, either Alan or Pat, and the amount of snow. I saw a story on the Reno news about a week ago, the evening news, where they were out at the Reno airport interviewing people who were coming to Tahoe from around the country on very short notice because there's snow here. It's a nice problem to have as opposed to the other side of that, but it is, as Commissioner Sevison pointed out, we care about what happens to that. We do have a traffic management plan really focused on getting people into and parked at the resort. We realize that we have a larger responsibility to play a role in being a community leader in the regional situation. You mentioned Commissioner Sevison, Highway 89, uh, Highway 80, Highway 267. The same thing right now is going on in the South Shore at Heavenly. Same thing is going on out at Kirkwood. All of the resorts are experiencing unusual visitation because of the combination of factors that we've not had in years. 2010, 2011 was the last good snow year uh, in the ski industry. So we realized that it's, you know, a bit of it is feast and famine almost. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we're not going to sit idly on the sidelines and do nothing. I think you've raised some good solutions. We have a traffic management plan that's in place that has got an internal committee. This is a copy of our traffic management plan on how we manage based on expected volumes. It's important to note, too, that the additional real estate that's been approved by Placer County and is being built out by the real estate uh, team inside North Star is intended to encourage people to come and stay longer inside the resort so they're not out on the highways. We have a 40 bus fleet. It's bigger than anything else in South Shore, North Shore uh, public agencies. We run that internally. We run that to pick up employees. We run that to lodging properties in Kings Beach. We also now run that into Reno to pick up employees too. We care about what happens on the regional road network, not just what happens when you make the turn into North Star Drive. That's not the full picture for us. It influences our guests, their experiences that you mentioned, through traffic like you, Commissioner, coming home uh, from the funeral, and it experiences our employees as well. We know that there are uh, issues on very peak days. The busiest days of the year happen usually on the holidays, in weekends where you've got great snow, clear weather, and good roads. That's when you draw the most business. You can predict it. You can see it coming. The California skier is a fair weather skier. They could go skiing if it looks good. They could go play golf. They could garden. They could tent. They could go play tennis. They could go sailing. They could go bike riding. The folks who come up from sea level, basically, Sacramento, San Francisco, they're not the hardcore committed skier that they are in other regions of snow country, like the Rockies. They could sometimes do it, sometimes not. Many of them choose to do it when those three conditions all line up. And we realize we've got to attack it. And our commitment to you is that we do not stop and say, well, we can't do anything about it. It's out of our hands. It's not out of our hands. And we do have a talented team of people that meet weekly and adjust what we're doing with transit schedules, with um, people directing into the parking lots to respond to what we expect to see in terms of conditions coming that weekend. Our real goal of this plan is to drive midweek capacity, not peak capacity. We don't want to add to the peak. We want to drive it where there is not uh, excess, where we have room for people. And frankly, we have a number of pricing options available to us to help encourage that behavior from season passes that are blacked out on Saturdays to ski school pricing, to lift pricing, to lodging pricing, peak versus non-week, we can, in fact, influence customer behavior for those folks who are not coming for a destination visit, but maybe say, you know, I don't want to pay $20 more for that ski school lesson, or I don't want to pay $20 more for that lift ticket this weekend. I'll wait and come when the prices are back down again. Same thing with our season pass, too. You have options, and we can help influence that behavior. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I would like to reserve time uh, 
at the end if there are any questions that I can respond to from the audience or from you. Uh, and we would ask you to support the staff's uh, recommendations to you and on to the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Chairman, I Let me see, I would uh, like to, uh, after, I think we need to take a little break, don't we? Or not? Are we okay? I'm, huh? Well, Jeff's seen, yes. <laughs> okay, so we need to take a little break. I would like to have not a, a full end of the weeds presentation on the habitat management sure. plan, but I would like to have just a, a little more a little more explanation Absolutely. on the wording here about the prudent responsible force management. Okay, so we're going to take about five minutes and then we'll do that. Hopefully it'll be real short and then we'll move on to the public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, folks, we're ready to go again. Let me see, as I mentioned before, I, I do just would like just a, a brief presentation on the uh, habitat management plan. And I guess what I'm kind of fishing for is North Star is entirely within a forest environment, and uh, the forest environment changes all the time. And so uh, I, I did hear that you have a timber harvest plan that covers the entire property that you manage. But uh, I guess what my question is, is maybe get a little bit into how, where it says here that uh, the county is expressing the, you know, the intent to encourage prudent, prudent and responsible forest resource management. And so my question is, you know, uh, what, what's your process there? Do you hire foresters or? Or what's your process in terms of uh, accomplishing this over the next 20 years? 
Nobody wants to get up to answer your question. Yeah, maybe <laughs> this. All, maybe all this pointing is pointing fingers at each other. <laughs> now, now we don't need to hear about the whole plan. But. Okay, <laughs> I'll take a shot at it. Um, I'm Jen Mater. I'm with North Star California, and um, to answer your question, yes, we uh, work with the third-party registered professional forester, uh, Daniel Bonchio, to help us manage the forest. And um, she basically prescribes, um, you know, carefully, careful civiculture treatments, mm -hmm. both for forest health um, as well as wildlife enhancement. And those are components of our HMP. Um, let's see. I wanted to just go back to our map. This way. Um, so the HMP actually has different targets for different zones. The more developed areas of the resort, zones A, B, and C, our goal there, because it's around our kind of the core of our resort, is for fire safety. Mm -hmm. And so the THPs are, the timber harvest plans are prescribed as such. And then as we work out towards zones D and E, they're actual um, specific force targets that um, these are in 30 to 50 year time spans to um, that lean a little bit more. I mean, they they do address fuel safety, um, avoidance of insect outbreaks, but also for wildlife enhancement, such as re retaining snags, as well as downed woody debris to provide um, wildlife habitat. And so, um, you know, the map illustrates the work we've done to date, and um, that work has been done in collaboration with North Star Fire. We've um, sought, sought and received grants from the California Fire Safe Council, um, which is a lot of that blue area that we did out in Zone E2. Um, we continue to seek grants. We continue our collaboration uh, with North Star Fire. And then um, the timber harvest plan that we currently have, uh, that's, a, that's a seven year plan. And um, we do have a kind of a priority map that the HMP provides of which areas are highest priority that we need to treat. And um, we basically, we work with our forester on an annual basis to see what funds are available, what grants might be out there, and what projects we can implement on a yearly basis. And so, that, um, that timber harvest plan was approved last summer, and in the fall, we completed 70 acres mm -hmm. of that work. And North Star Fire actually was able to um, take that timber harvest plan and use it for a portion of their work in Zone A. So um, it's, you know, it's carefully managed, and we realize this is something we just, we need to stay on top of. It's just not a one-time type of thing. We've got to work on I don't know, multiple zones over multiple years. So. so in seven years, then, you'll be going back and renewing your harvest plan? I, I believe so, or ask for an, an extension. extension. And, um, and we also work under the 10% exemption on the property. So the timber harvest plan specifically encompasses 576 acres. And it's more, um, we pulled a timber harvest plan because it allows for more intensive treatment uh -huh. that we believe our, our forests need to clear out, to open up the canopy and to, to clear out some of the dead and dying, some of the um, more susceptible trees that, to um, insect outbreaks or fire. Um, and then we also have the opportunity to work under a 10% um, exemption over the property as well and that's a that's a permit that we renew with cal fire every year so we have um we use that for cleanup and then more intensive treatment under the thp and that thp is good for seven years i believe we can extend um request several extensions on it and the other thing that thp allows if if we have a new area that all of a sudden becomes kind of a high priority area it can be amended so one of the things we find is, um, you know, depending on drought or wet years or whatnot, our, our priorities change depending on what's going on with the forest structure. And um, we're, we feel we're able to address that with that timber harvest plan and under the 10% exemption. So in, the, in your TPZ areas that are outside of the ski area boundary, then that would be where the 10% exemption applies? or. Um, I, so that THP actually applies 
to it will the 10 percent exemption applies to the entire resort the thp um has some specific areas i believe some of those are in in tpz but um the i the permits aren't differentiated by tpz tpz versus forestry zoning it's more um we, we address it by what kind of the forest targets so and that includes the whole uh, area yeah that includes the the whole area and our you know our third party forester we we check in with her on a, i mean she is actively working with us to figure out what our priorities are what we need to address now and to look to the future you know to to put together a plan that we can work through year after year okay and then the review would be through the uh, cal fire groups for cal fire foresters that's correct that's yeah. so that's your control agent right there right exactly we we were closely with uh jeff dowling who is well he was he was in the truckee cal fire office okay. and he over he oversaw our timber harvest and our our fuels management projects okay yeah. and so so you have controls and you have prudence in Okay. We do. <laughs> yeah, I guess probably the controls are what I was wondering about because the county isn't going to be involved in the wording in this document. So, but you do have controls. So. Right. But since we're not on Forest Service land, we we have to go through Cal Fire for right. everything. It's you know it's it's timber. So. And you have a forester that you're working with, and maybe Bollinger and other people too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Very helpful. Sure. I have a question. Oh. Uh, one not, more question. Not, not of you. Okay. Thank you. I'm Andrew. If that's all right. And you may defer this to someone else. Okay. Um, obviously, we're having, as you said, an exceptional snow year. And um, is there sufficient, when you have this kind of a situation, is there sufficient yeah. area to deal with the excess snow, uh, getting it out of the parking areas, getting it out of the roadways so that it doesn't inhibit the kind of traffic and certainly areas for people to park? And in the changes that you want to make, does that get better? or does it get worse as far as snow management? This is Andrew Strain again uh, with North Star. You're right, Commissioner Nader, snow removal and making sure we have as much capacity in the parking and roadways as we can, you know, to reduce friction, essentially, right. is something that starts as soon as we begin snow removal. It, it's fair to say it doesn't all get done at once, but we're between storms continuing to widen and create capacity for more snow removal, but snow management is absolutely a priority. Uh, I don't see it getting any worse at all. In fact, it's, it will likely improve if it does anything over time. We're still going to have the same fixed assets, the same fixed plant uh, as uh, we do today under the new master plan for the snow removal and snow surfaces, but uh, we absolutely try and create as much uh, safe uh, and usable space uh, as we can. It just uh, sometimes when you get literally uh, our numbers for the month of January were 319 inches, mm -hmm. average between our mid mountain station and our summit station. That's how much snow fell. You, you can't move 20 something feet all at once. It's, right. it, you have to do it by priority. Right. So you have sufficient area to store? Yes. Snow? Yes, we do. Yeah, as as the happen. landowner of, of pretty much all of the undeveloped lands, we do have areas to do that in. And that doesn't change, you're saying, going forward with the changes that are being proposed? That's correct. Okay. And I also would point out, as, as part of our communications plan, we use social media mm -hmm. as part of that traffic and parking management, as well as advance message signage to let people know what's going on mm -hmm. out on the highway and what they can expect uh, to get there. And, you know, you know this with many other activities that are popular get there early is, is right. part of the deal so those people are sitting out on 267 can kind of keep up to date on, uh -huh. oh on absolutely social media as to how soon they can maybe get there that's right, right. thank you Thanks. okay is that it okay well thank you and so let me see at this point uh, what we'll do is we'll move on to public comment and that includes uh, the people up in tahoe also so Anybody that wants to make a public comment, step forward. Hello again, Gary Davis, civil engineer in Tahoe City. I have a <clears throat> long history with this ski area. I started skiing there in the early 70s. And I've been doing civil engineering uh, off and on with them for over 25 years. And I've designed a lot of the water quality improvements on our projects and 
I want to say that North Star is uh, an exemplary ski resort, and we work for almost all the ski resorts in Tahoe, as well as Mammoth Mountain down south. And they have been a leader in environmental concerns, in mountain management, in employee housing, and in transit for all the time that I've been involved with them. Uh, they have done an exemplary job, and I hope that you would support this project. I've read the EIR. I'm very, very uh, comfortable with the results of that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And good afternoon. I'm Gene Roeder. Uh, I'm a North Star resident. I'm a member of the uh, North Tahoe Regional Advisory Council, and I'm also a psychologist practicing here in Auburn. Uh, so. Uh, uh, I uh, did write you a letter that's in uh, the packet, so I, I, I can keep my remarks uh, relatively brief. Uh, as Wayne was commenting, our council, of course, has been dealing with some pretty uh, dramatic issues over the last year or, or two years. It was very, uh, uh, very nice to have a project like this come before us that actually it doesn't involve any kind of real estate development. Uh, it's really just uh, an enhancement. Uh, to uh, to the uh, North Star experience for people. Uh, so as uh, staff pointed out, our council did vote in favor of this, asking you to uh, support it. Uh, so I'm here this morning uh, also, or this afternoon now, uh, to express uh, my support for it. Um, I'm glad the, uh, the weed warriors were mentioned. That's been a, a, a fun thing that I've been uh, involved with. Last year I was a, a captain and uh, the North Star uh, vice president was on my team. I got to boss North Star around. But, you know, that shows the kind of um, collaboration, I think, between um, um, the residents um, there and North Star that's been uh, very positive. So I'm, I'm here to voice my strong support for, for your support. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Johnson, members of the commission. My name is Wally Auerbach. I'm also a civil engineer in Tahoe City. Um, I submitted a letter to you previously, um, but I thought I'd come here today to amplify my comments. You know, I've tended to avoid making endorsements like this over the last uh, 36 years of business in North Tahoe. I wear a lot of hats, and uh, I've never really been comfortable endorsing projects that I have a direct relationship in. But um, for the record, I was part of the planning team on this particular project. In fact, over those 36 years, uh, I worked extens also worked extensively for North Star Resort for several owners and more than a few general managers. But that's exactly what brings me to the podium today because in all my experience with North Star, regardless of the ownership or the, uh, the leadership or whoever might be at the helm, I've found them to be careful, thoughtful, and committed stewards of their mountain resource. They've also been committed to engaging the community in every aspect of this project. They've garnered tremendous support from their stakeholders. They've evaluated the environmental resources over many years and documented those extensively through the Habitat Management Plan. And in planning those improvements to have minimal impact on those resources. So I have some experience in saying this, that North Star has a long history in doing things correctly, not only for the mountain, but for the community. And I encourage you to give them the tools to bring the mountain to even greater heights by approving the North Star Mountain Master Plan today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me, see, let me ask the, uh, the folks in Tahoe if there's anybody up there that would like to make a comment. Maybe we'll let Tahoe go next. If there's somebody down here, we'll get you. Good morning, my name is Melissa Hummel, and I'm coming as to give you um, a perspective from the community. Um, I've been skiing winters in Tahoe since 2004. In 2009, we bought a house off North Star Drive. We have four kids on the ski team, and they've been on the ski team since 2007. And um, for the past five years, I've been very heavily involved in the North Star Team Foundation, and I was the founding president for the first three years. So I come as um, very connected to the resort and um, very involved in the resort. Um, it's been a really exciting time at North Star, and we're really excited about the master plan. And there's three reasons I support the master plan. The first is the um, commitment to unparalleled skier experience. And I think Nadia and Andrew and their team has gone over all of the great improvements and enhancements. And you know, as a skier and customer, I'm really excited about all those plans. The second reason is the history of collaboration with community organizations. 
The North Star Team Foundation is a nonprofit, and we support all three teams at North Star. And it's been an incredible partnership with Vail and North Star to really create that strong, strong community and support the 650 athletes we have on our program. And it's really not only about competition, it's about building life skills for the kids. And included in the life skills is a deep respect for the environment and um, an appreciation for the environment. And that brings me to my third point is um, I found that North Star over the years that I've been there has a really strong culture of respect for the environment. And I think the habitat management plan speaks to that perfectly. It's really a collaboration between private industry and um, local organizations to benefit North Star not only today and, and um, you know, during this process, but for the long term. Um, it's uh, got perpetual management guide so that we can you know, ensure that the environment is safe um, going forward. Um, and two anecdotes I'd like to share is, um, you know, I wasn't part of the Weed Warriors, but it's really important to me as a parent that uh, North Star is at the forefront of pr protecting the environment and really showing our kids how important the environment is and I think it was really great that you know the North Star executives were out there cleaning the Tahoe Rim Trail, helping Truckee um, High School, you know, alongside the kids to show that that North Star is really involved in the community, um, and it sets a really um, high bar for our kids to understand how important preserving and maintaining the environment is. Um, and the second anecdote is I was just going down to our team room yesterday, and I didn't even know about it, but on the um, elevator wall was a flyer about maybe six or um, seven you know, resources and um, seminars for the employees to learn about what's going on in the environment. So I, f I find that North Star is heavily committed. Um, so for those reasons, I support the master plan, and um, I appreciate your time and energy in looking at this and I would ask for your support too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me see, uh, was there somebody else up in Tahoe that wanted to comment? And then we'll pitch a couple. Good afternoon, Chairman Johnson and Planning Commission members and county staff. My name is Alexis Aller, Executive Director of Mountain Area Preservation. Uh, as many of you know, uh, Mountain Area Preservation has reviewed the North Star Mountain Master Plan over many years since its early inception. In 2011 and 2012, MAP dedicated uh, numerous hours of staff time and our consultant resources to ensuring the plan was consistent with our prior settlement agreements and, of course, the negotiated habitat management plan, which is a guiding resource for the resort to utilize in order to protect sensitive resources by not allowing development in those areas, while then quantifying uses that would be better suited for specific resort zones for skier amenities such as within the North Star Mountain Master Plan. As Andrew stated the HMP is a one-of-a-kind collaborative effort amongst North Star, Mountain Area Preservation, and Sierra Watch, creating a long-term uh, framework for conservation and natural resource monitoring and mitigation. We really feel this could be an example for other resorts in the region um, and hope maybe that could be something that catches on. Uh, our biological consultants and MAP staff reviewed the North Star Mountain Master Plan to ensure the program and project level plans were consistent with the habitat management plan and our agreements. Uh, even with the delay, uh, we have still once re reviewed it again to find it is consistent. Um, something else for the commission to understand is that North Star does a yearly audit with us, so we are educated on what they're doing, such as the timber harvest plan, and we're constantly being uh, kept in the loop <laughs> about how, how resources are being managed. Um, I know many community members have raised concerns regarding the zoning text amendment for the timber production zones to allow lifts and trails. This was a subject that our organization reviewed quite carefully, requesting that this allowance apply only to North Star within Placer County and not within Basin Lands. We feel the language prepared by county staff and North Star sets a good guideline for existing ski resorts, knowing that North Star is primarily the only resort with the timber production land. Uh, within the boundaries. Uh, the North Star Mountain Master Plan also requires a housing mitigation plan um, with the need to build 
sold 42 units and we just respectfully request that North Star share that draft plan with us when it's ready as workforce housing is a high priority for our organization. Uh, this subject was brought up during uh, the presentations of traffic. We recognize that you know the, the North Star Mountain Master Plan does not intend to build additional parking except for the 20, 20 spaces for the future environmental campground. Um, but with traffic being a hot topic, we've had many people uh, asking us land use questions and concerns regarding traffic. And we would just like to see if there is some sort of um, traffic mitigation or management plan that could be applied to Highway 2. 67 on peak ski days for weekends and holidays. I think one thing uh, is to recognize that while the resorts, you know, this is a, a rare occasion since 2010 and 2011, but not only is it ski traffic, it's regular commuting traffic. And so similar to what Tahoe City does with coning uh, to create those additional breakdown lanes, just curious if there could be some sort of future mitigation for 267 to deal with these peak season and times. Uh, and then just in conclusion, we really want the commission to know and understand that we're very grateful for the collaborative working relationship we have with North Star. Over the years, they've been more than willing to work with us, our board, and our staff on areas of concern while keeping an open door for communications and negotiations for our group. So we just want to thank uh, North Star for that relationship. It's not only, uh, it's, it's sometimes rare, and we're very grateful for that, and we just want to thank you again for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have one more. Go ahead. From Tahoe. Good afternoon, my name is Jeff Brown. I'm a North Star property owner and business owner. Um, I would like to echo the comments that both Gary and Wally made as to uh, the, the high level of stewardship uh, from this management group towards the resort, having been around it for nearly my entire life. I very much appreciate the thought that this group has put into it and uh, feel strongly that this is a great group to execute on a plan that we've always known was out there to some extent, but uh, feel strongly that this is the final piece. I I appreciate Andrew's comments that we're not looking to grow uh, uh, peak dates or, or, or expand capacity, but rather fill in those midweek and off-season periods. As a business owner, we do beautifully over those peak times, but um, having uh, having these off-season um, opportunities will be very, very meaningful to our business and uh, the ultimate sustainability of not only the uh, the resort, but the vendors around the resort. So very much appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Okay, is that it from Tahoe? Okay, I think we have at least one or maybe two more. Oh, one more? Oh, okay. Didn't mean to leave you out. Come on forward. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, my name is Allison Pedley. I'm uh, executive director of the Truckee Trails Foundation. Um, it is our mission to build, maintain, and advocate for non-motorized um, dirt and paved trails in our region. We have a membership base of around a thousand supporters who support our mission. And you know, our, while our mission doesn't include uh, downhill skiing. Um, there is a lot in this plan that does pertain to to us and is very interest of strong interest to us, including the promise for um, some new dirt trails, some good connectivity with Nordic trails, and um, the possibility for some new mountain bike terrain. And this I all included in a letter I've already submitted. But what I really wanted to come here um, to say was just, just um, a comment on our partnership with North Star, which has been um, very, very meaningful to us. Um, they have a strong commitment to trails, um, and not just you know talking about trails on North Star property, but the past two summers, they have brought out over 100 employees to help us build tra and maintain trails that aren't even on North Star property. They just, again, a, a strong commitment to the environment and to the community. Um, to help, you know, enhance recreation. Um, but we've also, over the past couple of years, been working closely with North Star on um, some trails ideas that we have, um, connecting some trails on Forest Service property, maybe venturing a little bit onto North Star land. And, and here's the deal. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the, the um, conservation plan and, uh, sorry, the man management plan and, um, when we approach Jerusha with an idea, she doesn't just say, 
wow, that's great, I'm gonna sign on the dotted line, go start building. I mean, even for a dirt trail, um, there is a lot of um, attention paid to the um, proposal. We, I have met Jerusha out in the field, we have poured over maps. You know, this, the, the habitat management plan is, is a very serious thing for them. It is, it is, um, it is referred to even at the trails level. So, um, and again, this is a company that, that balances their planning efforts very, very carefully in a way that we, um, as trail builders who are trying to build sustainable trails really appreciate. And so we know we can trust them when we, when we partner with them. So I strongly encourage you to um, approve this North Star Master Plan um, EIR. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Ever see anybody else from Tahoe? Yeah, <laughs> not seeing anybody get up. <laughs> yeah, you're on the same time frame as us. It's good. Okay, so uh, in this room, anybody else that would like to make a comment? Step forward, go ahead. Yeah, hi, thanks uh, for having the meeting. I'm William Banka, I'm a RPF. And um, I'm the one who, I submitted comments on TPZ, quite a few. And I, I'm going to continue with my concern about the TPZ. And um, in the EIR, the EIR doesn't even mention the Zeberg Warren Collier Forest Taxation Reform Act of 1976, which created TPZ zoning. Prior to 70, 1976 in California, the value of standing timber was added to the value of the land and taxed annually. And because of that, many property owners had the incentive to cut their trees to reduce their property taxes, and the forest acreage is decreasing around the state. So the legislature completely revised taxation for timber and timberlands in 76 to encourage the protection of the forest areas and the continued use of that land for timber and production for other compatible uses. Um, since 76, timberland zone TPZ was assessed at a substantially lower value to encourage this um, a lot less than where development was permitted. For example, forestry land in uh, Placer County is assessed at $1,950 an acre. That's a cursory check of the assessor's books. Almost $2,000 an acre, whereas the TPZ is assessed at 46. And, you know, 20 times, you know, 1 20th of the rate of the development land, not the four times like Alan might have had in that report. And then the other thing is timber is not uh, taxed until it's, it's only taxed once when it's cut. But there's also been restrictions as part of that law, um, and, it's, and there's compatible uses and that go on timberland watershed, wildlife management, grazing, things like that, and continued timber production. Um, so the NEIR that doesn't even consider the law that created TPZ and defines compatible uses, it's not discussed anywhere in the EIR. Um, I think that's where the EIR is inadequate. On the other hand, um, the, the EIR and Alan's letter to you today talks about a, um, an email from CDF, and it's right here, and it's less, it's like five lines long. And it's, uh, it seems like the, the EIR relied solely on this to say that compatible uses, you know, ski trails are, are an okay compatible use in TPZ. Well, CDF doesn't even have the authority or the mandate to say what a compatible use is. The Board of Supervisors do by law. So it seems like things got flipped. I mean, this, this email that CDF cannot say that is a compatible use that's allowable. Only the, the Board of Supervisors can. That's mandated by the legislature. CDF's role is not to do that. They put out fires. They, they enforce the forest practice rules. This TPZ is not a forest practice rule. It's legislature. So I think you got the cart before the horse on that. Um, I, this should not substitute as an EIR, this one short paragraph. And I've met with the Board of Forestry twice down in Sacramento, and I've talked to Dwayne Shintaku, Resource Manager, Deputy Director and Resource Manager, George Gentry from the Board of Forestry, and Dennis Hall from the Forest Practice um, Division of CDF. And um, I met with them a lot in, in 2014 after the DEIR first came out. <coughs> and I would just encourage you to maybe clarify with them of the role of CDF. I mean, I think maybe CDF, if the Board of Supervisors approved those uses, they wouldn't say anything. They would, they're not going to argue one way or the other. They're not mandated to do that. But I think with the, uh, saying this email is why 
is, you know, is the basis for saying it's a compatible use. It just seems like it's backwards. So I would encourage you to talk to those CDF guys. And I can give you a copy of this email. I, Dallin says he's got it floating around here. It's in your document. It was attachment K, except I noticed the letter this morning doesn't have an attachment K listed in the list. There's this, and, um, and I've been meeting with CDF, and they tell me they're not mandated to make those kinds of decisions. They're just not by law. It's the, it's the act. It's the 76 law. So I think you got it backwards. So anyway, I hope you can consider that. And I know, um, could I have like one more minute to say another issue that was concerns me? A lot of people have said the TPZ will only, this amendment will only apply to North Star. And uh, yeah, that's what it seems like. North Star is the only one who has TPZs next to a ski area. They have over 3,000, 3,500 acres of it. So by allowing, suddenly taking TPZ that only North Star has inside a ski area and allowing them to build ski areas, Pulaski County may create a very exclusive item, a commodity that only one ski area has. The value of that is uh, who knows what it is, but it would be it would probably be astronomical, and it would be hard for another ski area, I think, to compete to go get land next to them that zone TPZ. Now that they know they can have ski trails on it, if a knowing and willing buyer next to it says, "Oh, suddenly, yeah, it's a commodity that is now wasn't developable before. I've been paying forty-six dollars instead of two thousand dollars a year on it, and now I have this commodity to uh, to sell you for a ski area." So it's. I'm concerned about that spot zoning issue. Um, it it only favors North Star, and I don't know. I'm, I'm I'd rather talk about forestry. I'd rather talk to you about a lot of forestry stuff. I did work at North Star for 15 years as the third party contractor for them uh, up until 2011, and uh, I'd rather talk about forestry stuff. But those are my two concerns that I really haven't brought up before. So I'd hope you guys consider that. Okay. Thanks. Well, thank you. It was morning, but good afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Stevens, North Star Property Owners Association, general manager. Uh, we're the old guard. We're the original association, so we're, we're one of the stakeholders. Um, I'd like to echo all the positive things about working with North Star uh, and the various other agencies, community service district, the fire department. Uh, we, we work a lot together. Um, and with every great plan, there's always maybe a couple of things that could get better, and that's why I want to talk about now, because it is a terrific plan. We first had this uh, habitat plan presented to us at the membership meeting in 2009. We've been quite aware of it. It's been a terrific plan, association, membership, totally supports it. Um, they still do today, they did at the time. Uh, we think it's a great uh, overall uh, expansion uh, for all the skiers and the users. Uh, our only concern is the J-lift, and not the J-lift in its, itself, but um, as Andrew once told me, uh, if, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Uh, we would like to be at the table in regards to the alignment, because it is preliminary, um, and uh, in regards to one of some of our closest neighborhoods, uh, the, the noise and the colors, all those things are in it, but we would like to be uh, more than just, uh, hey, the intent is to make it really good. We don't want intent, we want insurance. Uh, so we would like you to consider amending the conditions of approval that would in either change it from a project level to a program like the gondola from the Castle Peak parking, which we think is a, is a terrific process also. Um, but we want to be at the table uh, to be able to provide input and make sure that uh, membership is protected of their rights. So we're hoping that you will uh, recommend that, that, that we're at the table or amend the conditions of approval. Uh, any questions? I'm happy. To see, the J lift is is that the one that's on the far east side of the property? Yeah, it, it's the one that goes right over the uh, Highlands gondola. Right, right in the same area. So they'll disperse more skiers to different parts of the uh, resort and have better circulation. We support that. It's great, but it is very, very close to the houses um, for first couple hundred yards. Uh, we want to make sure towers are in the right place and then and someone who's built a you know three million dollar home all of a sudden doesn't have a, a a 30 foot tower right in the middle of their picture window uh we we just want to be out to be able to comment during that process make sense okay thank you great thank you anybody else 
Okay, well at this time we'll let the applicant, if you have more to say, come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any further uh, comments. I think uh, we've, we've done a good job of presenting our proposal to you and ask for your support in uh, recommending its approval to the board. Okay. Let me see, so I'm not remiss. Uh, well, I'm just going to oh, say go regarding the J-Lift, uh, isn't there a further environmental review as you go through that process to get a permit for that? It, 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 well, we've been working with staff, and they can answer it better, but I believe this is a project level, not a program. So if it got approved, we don't have any more saying, except it's the county that reviews the um, setbacks and things like that. But uh, just like the Highlands Gondola had a noise issue after the fact it got corrected, we want to make sure all this stuff is uh, addressed prior. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So I was a little bit remiss when I closed the public comment period. Uh, I wanted to check with the people in Tahoe to see is there any more from up there? I see a head shaking. No. Okay. So we're, we're clear on the public part of it. We're clear on the applicant. And so at this time, we'll bring it back to the commission. Put the recommendations up, please, because they're rather lengthy. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if there's no further. Well, there might be some more questions. I just want to ask Alan this is a question. Uh, oh, go ahead. Not so much on the last, the J lift, but on the uh, previous uh, Forrester's comments. That was a lot of comments. And, they're quite detailed on those several pages. Um, I don't want to say is there any merit to them because I'm sure there are, but is, uh, have they been addressed, I guess, uh, to your satisfaction? That good question. Um, we did have Patrick review, you know, the consultant, the various correspondence during our mm -hmm. due process, mm -hmm. during the EIR, the errata, mm -hmm. and so forth. He did respond um, to us stating that uh, the EIR is solid on that. And I do, do say, you know, Mr. Uh, Banca is doing a lot of research, which is fantastic. We want the best product. Um, we, however, the county has to outreach to CDF. Um, we can't third party. We need to ensure, and we do have a condition here um, requiring prior to improvement plans to get sign-offs. Um, that's the official last stage. So their authority has to sign that off and be satisfied with those conditions. So staff has reviewed it numerous times and we feel comfortable. That's why we we're before you right now. If we weren't, we would say we need more time to review and bring something back. But we feel very comfortable with what we have here and there's mechanisms in place to ensure that those will be followed through. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, one, one thing that he did mention and uh, is that uh, actually the final determination of what's compatible is with the Board of Supervisors? Is that uh, your view too? Yes. Um, the, the issue of whether the zoning text amendment should ultimately be approved is uh, subject to a determination of consistency with general plan policies. So that would be taken into account. I'd also note that that is exactly what the EIR did discuss and is required to discuss as part of CEQA is um, the various general plan policies and whether there's any uh, determination of inconsistency with those policies that's been identified. And I'm referring to page 4-11 of the draft EIR, which has an extensive discussion of those general plan policies, including ones uh, related to TPZ and whether there are any potential conflicts. The EIR did not find any. The ultimate determination of consistency is first based on this Planning Commission's determination of whether it can recommend approval of the ZTA to the, to the board. That would be based on whether the Planning Commission finds consistency with general plan policy. And ultimately, the board would have to decide the same in order to approve the ZTA. Okay. I'd also like to, if I may, make one comment about the issue of spot zoning that was raised in comments. Um, there seems to be a little a misconception as to what spot zoning is. So just for the record, I'd like to read a definition of what spot zoning means. Spot zoning occurs when a small parcel of property is restricted and given less rights than the surrounding property. And that's based on case law. So it's actually in situations where you have a small island of property that's more restrictive than what's, what's around it. 
Um, this issue was raised, was discussed with our office. We do not find this to be a, a spot zoning, the proposed ZTA. Okay, thank you. And then the, maybe another question or kind of, I remember in reading the information, and there's a lot here, that the county did or somebody did check with some other counties that have similar zoning uh, zoning so at least what that tells me is that you didn't rely solely on a email from uh, Cal Fire so maybe you can I mean what what, what did you do uh, you know through thorough research I mean staff reviews it um, me personally, um, we had staff review it, and they got back to me on that, and that it was presented in the staff report. Um, so it is something that we rely on to say that there, there's allowed in other TPZ areas, you know, ski. Um, you know, it is mentioned in Alpine County and, and others that it is allowed. Okay, okay any other so questions? So you're comfortable it's not spot zoning then? Would you like a motion now, or are you ready to take more testimony? Well, if uh, somebody has some comments or questions, otherwise we can have a motion. And just as a reminder, these are all recommendations to the board. Mm -hmm. And they're individual. We have to vote on each one of them, all five of them. Yes, please. I'd like to go one by one just so we yeah. have it for the record. Okay. I'll start the motion process here, I guess. Uh, uh, I recommend that we adopt re a resolution to certify the North Star Mountain Master Plan and finally em environmental impact report SCH number 20121120 and a data sheet prepared pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act and adopt the mitigation monitoring program reporting program supported by the incorporating by reference in its entirety the findings of fact and statement of overriding consideration attachment D and the following items item A and B as listed in the agenda how am I doing <laughs> okay so uh, got a second <laughs> okay and so we'll do a roll call all right mr. Curry yes mr. Sevison yes Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Rokuchi? Yes. Whoops, I mixed it up there. Thank That's you, gentlemen. Okay. <laughs> They're flexible. They're That's flexible. Okay. Mm -hmm. We paid permission. No, you, didn't, you didn't fool us. Okay. We paid attention. <laughs> I'll further okay. move approval that we adopt a resolution to amend the Martis Valley Community Plan MVPCT, MVCP land use diagram to relocate an existing tourist resort commercial land use area that comprises 0.68 acres from one side of the ski resort to the other as depicted in exhibit eight to exhibit E supported by the following findings finding a is stated in the agenda second just as a, a clarification that is exhibit a to attachment E as an Edward did I miss attachment E no I'm exhibit sorry. A attachment A attachment E supported by the following finding listed on the agenda is item A I think Fred seconded. Well, I did. Oh, Richard. Okay, we'll do a roll call. Mr. Curry? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Rokucci? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Thank you. I'll further move that we adopt an ordinance to rezone two existing forest residential, forestry zone district areas that comprise 1.33 acres and 0 0.68 acres in size and relocate within the same TPZ area so that one would align with the relocated Martis Valley Community Plan land use designation square and the other would align with one of the campsites as depicted in exhibit A to attachment S supported by the following findings A as in the is posted in the agenda second. Jeff. okay okay we have a motion and a second uh, we'll do a roll call mr. Curry yes mr. Sevison yes mr. Moss yes uh, mr. Nader yes. mr. Rokuchi yes mr. Johnson yes thank you and finally 
I'd like to recommend to the Board of Supervisors, further recommend to the Board of Supervisors that we adopt an ordinance to amend Placer County Code Chapter 17, Article 17.04, Section 17.04.030 to amend the definition of ski lift facilities and ski runs in Article 17. 106 section 17.16.010 D Timberland production zone to allow for the development of ski lift facilities and ski runs as conditionally permitted use within the land boundaries owned and or operated by existing ski resorts within the Timberland production zone land located outside the Tahoe basement attachment G supported by the following findings uh, A and B on about next page turn, them over, turn the page C over oh I'm sorry I got there went, right. went the wrong way A and B and A and B as it shown in the agenda Is that? Uh, for the record we just spotted a typo um, I'm not going to make you redo it, <laughs> but uh, the, it is Article 17.16 is the second article. Oh, the section number is it. correct. Oh, second part, oh, 1 6, okay. Uh -huh. Okay, we so move. Second. Okay, roll call. Mr. R. Curry? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Rokuchi? Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you. And the last one is approve a conditional use permit to allow the North Star Mountain Master Plan that would guide development of the ski resort over a projected 20-year period. The master plan would allow the, for the expansion of the existing ski terrain, including six new mechanized ski lifts and associated trails, a high-speed gondola that would extend from the Castle Peak parking area to the North Star Village, a new snowmaking and associated infrastructure, additional trails and trail widening, and five skier bridges, four new skier service lodges and facilities, restroom, food, drink, service, and seating, improvements to extend skier service sites, relocation of an existing cross-country ski center, and two new campsite areas subject to the conditions of approval and supported by the following findings a, B, C, and D is shown in the agenda. Second. Well done, Larry. Okay. Motion in the second. Where's uh, lunch? Roll call. Mr. R. Curry? Yes. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Rokuchi? Yes. And Mr. Johnson? Yes. Thank you. Thank For the record, because this is a recommendation to the board, there are no appeals. It will go right. straight to the board. Okay, no appeals. Let me see, I might mention to the gentleman that was wanting to uh, be involved in the location of the ski, ski lift. Uh, J lift. The J lift. Yeah. I think there'll be ample opportunity for you yeah. to participate in that as the plans are approved and finalized. And so I suggest that you stay in contact with the folks at the ski area and they'd be happy to uh, work with you on that. Sure, could I say something? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I want to thank the, our tech people. Mm -hmm. This was incredible. Uh, how was the experience up there? Yep. Was it good? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Let's uh, try to do this more often if it works well and gets good participation. So thank you to each of them. And I want to thank Northstar. This was an exceptional experience for, of, of what we've gone through in Tahoe. You did an amazing job of outreach to the community, and I want to thank you for that. I hope it's a template for others up there because it's a great model. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. you get yeah we have we have piles of uh, material here. If you want some of that back, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to. I'd yeah, like a couple to, of feet. <laughs> I'd like to also. Is it thank, snowing in Tahoe City? Hello. I'd like to. I'd like to also thank the North Star people. It, it was a good project. It was nice to see Sierra Watch on their side. Yeah. Since, since uh, they weren't on my side, at least last year, 
but also I wanted to put the re bed to, re to the rest, the, uh, the uh, rumor that Mr. Arcuri and myself are going to run against our prospective supervisor at the next election because we're able to, to be here in, in, in their spot. That's, that, that's a rumor. That's, that's, fake, that's fake news. We are better looking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, with that, the meeting's closed. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>